Big news. I have some important news for you. Interesting news. It's Blake and Aaron's Spilling the Tea with Sandy. K-Man's top news headlines of the day from CMR. Morning, Sandy. Good morning, Blake and Aaron. Morning. What do you have for us on a Tuesday? Okay, so a bit of court news. <clears throat> we spent all day in court yesterday. Oh, really? Listening to the Miss K-Man Universe trial. Oh. Yes. And- Is it... Is it? It's interesting you put it that way because is it is it a Miss Cayman Islands trial or is it Tiffany's trial? Well, she holds the title. That so is true, but she is she's not she on trial was, for something related to Miss Cayman. Though. No, no, no. But right, she's okay. Miss Cayman Islands Universe and Tiffany Connolly at the same time. Hmm. All right. And so, what um, right. It was an all-day trial. The judge was trying to push it forward, but of course uh, it was not completed. So they will return in December. It's what's called a part heard. Um, And essentially the prosecution called their three witnesses. So they called um, the father. Uh, He was one of the people assaulted. The two primary individuals, well, three people really, because she also assaulted a police officer, but um, she assaulted a man, his son, and then the police officer at the detention center. Hmm. So, um, very, very um, powerful first witness, I must say. Um, we're going to talk about it a little bit this morning, but yes, uh, it seems like her defense is potentially that she just has serious mental health issues. And uh, the lawyer on cross-examination was asking a lot of questions about whether or not the police had had training dealing with people with mental health issues. And it was kind of like, like he really belabored the point a lot. Um, to the point where at one point the judge asked him to move on. And do they? Um, they've had some initial training, apparently. But, I mean, they're not mental health experts <laughs> by mm-hmm. any stretch of the imagination. So, so um, what did you hear as far as from that witness, that uh, the testimony as far as what happened? Oh, my gosh. It was, it was like a night of terror based on what the witness said. I mean, at one point he even broke down on the stand and started crying. Kind of sad, actually. Yeah. Um, wow. But yeah, I mean, he was his son was bitten, kicked in the groin, um, punched, scratched. He had his glasses broken. He was head butted, punched, scratched. I mean, it was just. It, it's hard to imagine physically that she's even capable of any of those things when you look at her. But yeah, but we're gonna we're gonna break it down this morning for our listeners because there's quite a bit that came out yesterday. Mm-hmm. Um, in other court news, a police officer has been charged with intimidating a witness. Mm. So Courtney Levy, now relieved of his uh, duties as a police officer, he was an auxiliary constable, 45 years old, and he's been formally charged now with um, a number of offenses, including breach of trust, doing an act intended to pervert the course of public justice. Mm-hmm. This is the case where the father has now been convicted of killing his son. And apparently the allegation during that trial, which obviously the judge believed because it was a a big part of the defense case was, oh, don't believe this story, was that one of the key witnesses didn't come forward at the time because she was threatened by this police officer. Yeah. That if she did come forward, I guess there'd be some kind of consequences. Which is only making people not want to come forward more if you're like, well, this happened already. Mm-hmm. So why would I want to come forward yeah. with evidence if there's already people, you know, if you're already skeptical of who you would be reporting to? Yeah. I mean, especially a police officer. My gosh, yeah. it's, it's shocking. Mm-hmm. So um, he has been charged. So it's like um, obstruct- obstruction of justice. Sort of. Yeah. 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 So this is, very, this is a very serious. Intimidating offense. witness. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. That's pretty serious. Very, for especially for police officers. So, I mean, breach of trust is the part that comes in yeah. as an officer, a former officer of the law. Um, the attacker, remember the South Sound attacker who attacked that woman in January that was jogging in South Sound? Yeah. Yeah. yeah? So uh-huh. he was sentenced yesterday. And for how long? 25 months. How? 35 25, months. 25. Oh, God. I thought you said so just five. Just over two years. It's still not. Yeah. So he's been in custody since May. So he'll come out before that time, obviously. And pretty much they only serve 60% 
but um, they only charged him with ABH, which is kind of interesting. But anyway, he once he's out, he'll be he'll be um, deported from the jurisdiction. The judge, you know, tried to send a very clear message that what he did was egregious, not just to the victim, but the entire community who was obviously, you know, women shouldn't be afraid to go out jogging because of somebody like him. But that fear was put that this is a real threat, that potentially someone, you know, like uh, Rupert Hodgson Ingram is his name, could possibly just grab you and throw you in the bushes and try to assault you. And where was he from? Uh, Nicaragua. Mm. So he'll be sent back home after he serves a sentence. Gotcha. And uh, the victim has been so brave. You know, we've done an interview with her. She's yeah. going to come back on uh, the show and do a post interview with us as well. So do you think two years, because you know more, Sandy, do you think two years is enough for what she went through? Well, no, not for what she went through, but for what they charged him with. And this okay. is where I think mm -hmm. a lot of times people don't always get the nuances in the law, but for what they charged him with, the upward limit was three years, um, ABH. So, you and know, that, given that the period is, that is, assault time, battery? is that what that stands for? Aggravated. Um, assault occasioning. It's nope. um, mm -hmm. assault occasioning uh, bodily harm. And, and a lot of times the prosecutors, and I know this comes up in a lot of cases, will only charge or chart or make a charge for what they can prove. Right. Um, yeah. yeah cause they've got to be able to prove it. Right. They got to be able to prove and, it. And, and, and also they, they not just what they can prove, but they actually want to win the case, which right. a lot of people might not think about, but yeah, if it's, that's true. you know, if it's a much more serious charge, they may not be in a position to win, which means that he would walk away scot-free. So, I mean, Deciding what to charge <clears throat> people with can be a little bit of a legal. But do you think um, it's, um, would it be unusual for the judge then to see and hear the case knowing that probably could have been charged with more, but then give him the maximum for the lesser charge that he got? Do you think he should have gotten the three years then? Um, well, he pretty much did, but he's already got time served. So the things that would have been deducted from Oh, the three years. And she did express that she wished that she could have given him more than that. Mm. But, you know, she, her, her hands are definitely tied or any, any magistrate or judge, you know, their hands are tied by, by what's before them. Well, the good news <laughs> is that guy is no longer in the public and he will never be yeah. again because once he's out of prison, he'll be, he'll be deported. deported. So. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, quite an unfortunate um, situation. All right. Yeah. So all day yesterday we were in court. Uh, getting updates on a lot of court news. Um, so the police officer, he's actually going to be in court today for his first hearing now that he's been formally charged. Hmm. Gotcha. Yeah, Alrighty. so those are some of your news headlines today. That's a busy uh, Tuesday morning. Yeah. I know. Absolutely. Catch Sandy's show right now on Bobo 89.1 FM. We'll see you tomorrow for Wednesday headlines. All right? I'm okay, kidding. sounds good. All right, folks, good morning. How is everybody? Let's go ahead and play our intro jingle and let's get this show on the road got lots to talk about today peppermint sorrel ginger fever grass or english get it ready your morning tea just got hotter Ooh, honey child on the cold hard truth bobo 89.1 and cayman's number one talk show are bringing you morning talk like no one else monday rewind impact wednesdays caribbean connections and much more don't miss a beat with what's happening in the local community just keep sipping your tea what a mess here's your host live and direct from the cayman islands sandy hill All right, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Cold Hard Truth, another Tuesday segment. So, of course, as you guys know, every Tuesday, pretty much, we are here with the wonderful people um, from Health City. So today is Rundown Tuesday. Before we get into any other discussion, we have a little medical and uh, community educational segment for you guys. So I hope that you certainly enjoy this. We've got some guests this morning who are going to be joining us from Jasmine. Uh, this is an organization that does a lot of amazing work, <clears throat> hospice care, essentially, um, in the community. So we are uh, just absolutely tickled to be joined by, let me see, we've got uh, Miss Ansley uh, Esterlin, Marketing and Fundraising Manager for Jasmine. 
And we also have Felicia McLean, who's the Director of Operations and Nursing for Jasmine as well. I think we may have Dr. Vanitha, who's going to join us a little bit later on. And she is um, at Health City. She's a consultant medical oncologist and also a Jasmine board member. So let's go ahead and say good morning to Ansley. Good morning. And we've got Felicia, who's also joining us. Good morning, ladies. Morning. How are you guys doing today? Very good. good. Awesome. So we want to talk a little bit um, about Jasmine. It's so uh, interesting because, you know, this this year for the National Heroes Day that's coming up, they're looking at organizations, um, NPOs, that have really made an amazing difference in the community. And I think that Jasmine is certainly one of um, those organizations. And so let's tell people a little bit about, you know, who you guys are and what it is that you do. You want to do it? <laughs> Go for it. Um, so Jasmine, um, like you said, um, known for our hospice care. We started out as payment hospice care, but actually we rebranded a couple of years ago to mm -hmm. be Jasmine Palliative and Hospice Care. Um, mm -hmm. And that's one of the very exciting things that we're really pushing forward this year is our full palliative care program. Um, right. Making sure that um, anyone with any sort of chronic illness, be it malignant or non-malignant, um, has the support that they need, symptom management, family support, emotional and spiritual. Um, and of course, as typical with Jasmine, all for free. Wow. So what, what exactly is palliative care? I'll let Felicia do that, that one. Yes. What does that term mean? So palliative care in the simplest form is alleviation of suf suffering. Um, and okay. so basically the whole goal of it is, is it's back to Cicely Saunders with the whole movement of hospice, but in the general sense of you had people that were chronic and terminally ill who had a host of different symptoms, not just physical. So it's not just looking at the um, treating the medical results. Okay, I've got a low blood blood this and I need to treat it. Mm -hmm. It's looking at the psychosocial, the um, the spiritual, the whole person on a whole and to see if they're suffering in any one of those parts that we can help allevi alleviate by, by helping and coming alongside them. So if there's a family who may have financial issues, but because one person has become ill, then it's mm -hmm. looking at that and how we can help them. If mm -hmm. it's a person who, you know, is dealing with struggling with role reversal because now they're no longer the main provider, then it's mm -hmm. psychosocial um, support in that regards because they're suffering in different parts. It's not just about pain and it's not just about the end of life, but it's right. what that disease does to the whole person and the family unit as they, 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 they go through this disease process. Wow. So, I mean, that's, that's a lot of support. And of course, you know, we can appreciate, even if we've not been through it on a personal level, we can appreciate that um, a major illness impacts everyone mm -hmm. in a family, both immediate family and um, even sometimes extended family and other people in the community. So it's good to know that there's some support that is available to those individuals. So, you know, World Hospice and Palliative Care Day was uh, recently observed on October the 8th. And the theme this year was healing hearts and communities. What does that theme mean um to you guys at jasmine well you want to go go for it, go for it. <laughs> uh, i mean it, it says it all in in the end of the day i mean as we just mentioned um chronic illnesses um illnesses in general affect the whole family and mm -hmm. you need to start with you know you can treat the body but if you don't treat the soul the mind you've, you've lost the battle yes you may have healed the human being but it, it's getting back to the heart and, and community is at the heart of it. And so it's not about going it alone. It's about the community support, which which is, encompasses everything that Jasmine is about. Um, mm -hmm. And then also, like you said, healing the heart. Like, let's let's get to the root of the problem and let's ensure that that we treat each person with the dignity and the respect that they, de they deserve. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Um, healing hearts and communities. That's um, so incredibly important, I think. So... Um, someone at what stage would someone reach out to to jasmine so i know you said that you know obviously there's been an expansion of what you offer um through the palliative care aspect but um you know i'm say i'm a person just in here listening to the program and i've got someone who's sick how do i know it's time for me to reach out that's a great question it's one of the things that we we work a lot on trying to educate <clears throat> basically any stage so if you were actually 
just diagnosed with, let's just say, kidney disease, you mm -hmm. could actually reach out to Jasmine at that point in time to see how we could help the family transition through maybe needing dialysis, maybe needing mm. support in that regards. Doesn't mean we're going to give you financial support, but we can help you find the means within the community that can help you because it's new to you, but it's something okay. we do every day. Um, it doesn't mean you're going to stay on our service the whole time either. So you could come on. We could help the family and the patient um, get used to the new norm. And then if they're mm -hmm. managing well, they'll be discharged from our services and they can call us if and when they need us again, because it's a journey. We'll journey in and out of their lives through the mm -hmm. course of their illness based on how they're managing. If it's talking to a, a child about the, the new diagnosis and how they're managing, then you could also, you know, we can recommend there and try to partner with these family members throughout that. Um, but anyone can make a referral. So and anyone can call and we'll touch base with them and then we'll figure out who their primary care physician is and how we can support the primary care physician in managing that palliative case or that end of life case. Um, and then if they're in agreement of wanting us to partner, then that's how they actually come on to our service. Mm -hmm. All right. So that's wonderful to know. And folks, of course, if you have your own questions um, about Jasmine, please give us a call at 936-BOBO. That's 936-2626. We do have, I see Dr. Vanitha uh, Benoy has also joined us now as well. So we'll go ahead and bring her on screen. Good morning, Dr. Vanitha. How are you? Good morning. I'm good. Thank you. Good. So good to see you and have you here this morning. So we know that you're on the um, board of directors for Jasmine. So you're also, you know, um, a consultant medical oncologist at Health City. Why did you decide um, to be on, on the board at Jasmine? What does Jasmine mean to you? Yeah, so, you know, um, I'm an oncologist. That means mm -hmm. I deal with patients um, uh, with cancer. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, cancer is a chronic illness. Like, um, of late, we treat it as a chronic illness. Mm -hmm. Patients, are, people are living longer and with all the new treatments available. And as a result, they have a lot of symptoms. They, you know, it is a journey. Cancer mm -hmm. is a journey. Where, you know, we have to deal not just with the disease, but we also have to deal with the side effects of treatment, the emotional, social, financial. I mean, it's a whole, you know, you have to treat the patient as a whole and not mm -hmm. just the cancer. So this was something that we, you know, we are, we are taught um, right from our training days. And um, during my oncology training, I've also done a basic palliative care course. And that actually, you know, made me realize the importance of early palliative care in the management of patients with cancer. And I was very pleasantly surprised when I moved to Cayman and found that we have a hospice care, you know, and uh, we work very closely with the team ever since. And mm -hmm. I would say that I'm very pleased to see the benefits that my patients and their families. So we should not forget the families in this context. So yes. how much, you know, they contribute to the improvement of quality of life, because when we deal with advanced cancers, the, the our goals are, you know, ex, not just extending their survival or improving how long they live, but also their quality of life. So mm -hmm. um, as physicians, we often forget that aspect. You know, the quality of life is very important, not just for the patient, also for their families. So, um, you know, palliative care is a very, very important, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, aspect of patient care that uh, you know we are very pleased to have um we're very proud to have to work closely in association with uh, jasmine right from the time we were hospice care came in hospice care and i joined the board five years ago and when the rebranding process was happening and i can only see the growth the exponential growth and the and how the community is perceiving us now thanks to the efforts of the team the wonderful team that i'm very proud to be working with and Health City has always been a proud supporter of um, Jasmine. Um, yes, I, I, I think it's important. Um, and perhaps, uh, Felicia, you can tell us a little bit about this. But, you know, having the support of organizations um, such as Health City and others, I'm sure, um, has to be an incredibly important part of Jasmine's success and its ability to offer, you know, these ongoing services. No, for sure. Um we're a nonprofit and we don't charge our patients anything. Everything is free. Uh -huh. Some some nonprofits still still charge something. It just goes back into the pot. But for us, we we don't want anyone to not have access to care because they cannot afford it. We don't want that to be something that would limit them from getting, as Dr. Benoit said, the support that not only the patient but the family needs. But we have 
have not and cannot do it without the community support and and organizations such as Hell City partnering with us on our vision, missions, and goals to ensure this happens, not only from the financial, but as Dr. Benoit said, an understanding of who we are, what we do, so that we can help the people in the Cayman Islands earlier on um, through their disease process versus waiting just for, okay, well, there's now nothing more we can do and we're just hospice. Mm -hmm. And um, it, we, we just couldn't do it without the community support. Um, and I think Thankfully, the community at large recognizes the important work that we do, hence our new beautiful facility um, that we wouldn't have had without the community support and their own initiative to really want to offer um, palliative and hospice care in the Cayman Islands to everyone that's in, in Cayman. So it, it's a huge thing for us and we are thankful mm -hmm. for Health City um, sponsorship and support forever. <laughs> Yes. Wonderful. All right. Let's talk a little bit about some of the um, activities, if you will, that um, you have sort of on an annual basis, some of the events. So you've got the memory circle. What exactly is the memory circle? So go for it. So memory circle is um, basically a grief recovery group. We used to have one a long time ago when we were in the Kunk Shell house that was in person um, mm -hmm. where people had the chance to come once a month and meet with a counselor and have that kind of group support. Um, and then it, it died a bit for a bit because we didn't have a space. And then when we open our new facility, we relaunched what we then call memory circle um, mm -hmm. to allow group counseling group recovery group support in regards to grief loss um, in that regards and it's open to anyone um, who has had a loss in our community um, and and just needs a safe space to talk and share and maybe even just listen to maybe what someone else is going through and know they're not alone um, we will eventually come back to in person but right now we do that on zoom once a month, the second Wednesday of every month. Um, and it starts at 6.30. If someone in our community has lost someone and just feeling like they're struggling, not sure mm -hmm. if this is normal, not normal, um, I would encourage them to reach out to us um, and, and I will get them in touch with the bereavement person that, that oversees that particular service um, mm -hmm. so that they, they don't have to be alone um, and they can get that support. What I will add to our um, <clears throat> grief support that we also do, I don't think it was shared to you, um, is we also, by the grace of God, have a sponsorship from R3 that allows us to offer four free one-on-one -on -one counseling sessions with a counselor to go through that um, kind of grief. So if you're a person that isn't quite ready for that group, but really mm -hmm. still needs someone to talk to, we mm -hmm. welcome you yet again to get out in touch with us. You don't have to have been a patient in our service. Um, you know, all it means is that either I've had a loss or I'm even anticipating a loss. What people tend to sometimes think is I'm not allowed to grieve because I have to keep the hope that my loved one is going to make it through it. But it's still mm -hmm. a very hard journey. And the thought process that your loved one may not be with you for that much longer, you start to grieve from before you start to have those symptoms. And so even anticipatory grief, um, we, we've seen that some of our patients get some help or family members get help with even that with what's mm -hmm. to come. And so that's another service that we offer in regards to our brief um, um, support that we offer there. Right. Hmm. That's so interesting. So grief support um, services, there's the memory circle and also one-on-one -on -one counseling available. And, you know, we keep, you know, stressing, we had mental, mental health awareness day earlier in the month, and we keep stressing the importance of people um, trying to prioritize their mental health and just being more aware of uh, their feelings and, you know, kind of, of where they're at, um, you know, psychologically for sure. Mm -hmm. So again, um, ha ha Jasmine Palliative uh, Care Center, um, you know, offers a variety of services. I'm so glad to see really that this is, this is one of them. So folks, if you're struggling, you know, sometimes as a primary caregiver, we don't always want to admit that we're struggling. Um, because, you know, we think that that makes us look ungrateful sometimes, or especially if it's a parent, that we owe this to our parents and we're supposed to do it as though we're, you know, super men and women. But it comes with a lot of, of stresses, right? So um, it's really wonderful to hear that this is actually available through Jasmine. So we do have some questions that are coming in on WhatsApp, and don't be shy, folks. Uh, this one says, good morning, Jasmine is an awesome facility. They were so caring and understanding and gave wonderful support when our elderly relative passed away this March. Uh, they deserve a thousand uh, percent of the community support. We have another person who has a question. He says, morning, Sandra. I don't know if my question is appropriate, but I'm curious. Having seen so many people in hospice, 
what are their thoughts on uh, euthanasia, which is legal in other countries like Switzerland? Please extend my apologies if the question is inappropriate. Hmm. Not inappropriate at all. Um, it is a common question that comes up around the world and um, we're no different here in the Cayman Islands with that question. What I will say is that, first of all, it's not legal in the Cayman Islands, so we're, we've not even gone there. Mm -hmm. um, but, but I do feel that with proper palliative care and, and hospice care, the need for euthanasia can be somewhat outweighed. Um, a lot of times people don't fear death itself because we all know we're going to die. What mm -hmm. we fear is how we're going to die, what that's going to look like, losing that control, that dignity, mm -hmm. and not wanting to have that. But with proper early palliative care and hospice care through that disease process, we can figure out what it is that they're afraid of, what symptoms may come, and do our best to help alleviate any suffering or any, any of those issues that might arise within that dying process so mm -hmm. that they maintain their dignity, they're not suffering in pain, um, and they have a good quality of life until they die, um, which is really what everyone wants. They want that good quality until I die. And so with euthanasia, it's like, I can take it when I want to take it so that I die on my terms. But with proper palliative care and the support of a team like what we do, we talk through all of the things that you're concerned with and, mm -hmm. and help to aid a good, dignified quality of life until death. Yeah. It's so interesting that that person um, mentioned Switzerland, for example. Um, just recently, just last week, I was reading a very interesting and sad story about a young lady, only 23 years old um, in Belgium. She had survived a terror attack when she was a teenager. And uh, she was dealing with such um, severe depression. She had attempted to commit suicide on multiple occasions. And she actually opted, which apparently it's legal in, in Belgium, um, to um, choose euthanasia at the age of 23. I mean, it's just such an incredibly sad story. But, um, you know, this was someone who was suffering from severe depression and PTSD due to a bomb attack that happened, which she was there at the age of 17. So, um, so I will sad. comment on that. So um, another thing we recently just did as a part of our um, celebration of World Hospice Day, we had our palliative care conference and we brought a speaker down, Dr. Um, Shapir Rosenberg, who is a psychiat psychiatric doctor first and foremost, and then did his um, a second in palliative care. And so we had a lunch and learn with some of the um, um, counseling um, departments on the island and, and mm -hmm. psychiatrists just to talk about um the, the benefits of palliative care in mental health diseases. As you mm -hmm. said, that's a hot topic um, right now. People are finally starting to demystify having a mental illness and, mm -hmm. and it being just another illness that someone could suffer from and where palliative care can partner with that. And there was a, a case study that we reviewed in there where there was um, someone who suffered from anorexia um, and I think some other disease, I can't remember what it was, who at some point in time did end up having hospice care for his chronic illness and allowed to die a um, natural death that was caused by his anorexia, um, mm -hmm. but with palliative care coming alongside and journey with the family and ensuring that they weren't suffering and they weren't in pain during that process. So they didn't do euthanasia, but palliative care supported that patient on that, that terminal pathway, um, just, just aiding and, and making sure that they were comfortable and the family had someone to talk to and was supported. Because if, if you think about the girl, imagine the family members of this 23 year old, or it's like, okay, this is what I want to do. How do you even mm -hmm. begin to support that from a, a mental health standpoint for the family? Yeah. Um, and so the important debt again of palliative care, um, mm -hmm. coming alongside in hospice care in just all kinds of diseases, um, to ensure that suffering is alleviated, alleviated in that situation. Wonderful. Tell us a little bit about the Lunch Club. So this sounds um, like quite a nice event. So that is um, beyond kind of our, our medical and, and familial care. Mm -hmm. This is another one of the things that we do for our community. Mm -hmm. um, our lunch Club is once a month. Um, our caregivers led by our wonderful Miss Gloria cook a delicious meal for our patients, um, for the family members of patients. For It can be a part of um, the bereavement programs that we have, mm -hmm. um, but it's also just an opportunity for those that are involved with Jasmine, whether they be volunteers, donors, patients, family mm -hmm. members, 
to come and have a little bit of fellowship and a little bit of um, feeling like you are part of a community. We find these experiences can also be very isolating for some families. Um, and if we can kind of alleviate the isolation, that will also alleviate the stigma, alleviate the stress associated with the disease, um, and then finding a lot of support within the social network of Jasmine. Mm -hmm. All right. So monthly um, sort of lunch get together. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. And of course and you've got fun. Wallace and Hunter and like Felicia said, one of the yeah. things we, we can't do this without the community's help. Yes, absolutely. And you do have some annual fundraising events. Um, you've got the Christmas event that's coming up. So Light Up a Life 2022, which is coming up at the end of next month. So tell us a little bit about that event, um, the date and all the details that people want to get involved. Sure. So Light Up a Life is Tuesday, November 29th, and it'll be at Kamana Bay um, over by the water in front of Cayman National. Um, yeah. It is a free event. It is open to the community. Um, what we do is we have stars where um, if you give us the information, we'll have the name of someone you'd like to remember written on the star and then you can pick it up at the service and and hang it on Jasmine's tree. Um, there is a $10 suggested donation for a star, but mm -hmm. again, we don't wanna, we don't wanna exclude anybody um, if they don't have those resources. Mm -hmm. um, this is again, part of the healing process. If you've lost someone, the holidays tend to be a really difficult time. So coming to this event, taking a moment to remember a loved one, and then also seeing that you are surrounded by other people who are experiencing the same challenges and, and at various points in it. Um, we have a grief counselor that'll speak. We have a pastor that'll speak. Um, and of course, um, our um, medical director, Jenny Hopte, will speak. So it's a great opportunity to come and um, just remember someone before jumping into the holidays. And it's, and it's very family friendly as well. I don't, I don't know if you had the pleasure of ever coming to one. If not, I invite you at this point in time, yeah. because it is a really special moment for everyone in our community to realize that they're not alone, that they're, uh -huh. we've all suffered some kind of loss and, and the kids come out and they're hanging on, hanging a star for whether it be a parent, whether it be a grandparent, um, it's not scary, but it's very, um, a, a, a nice quiet moment to reflect with other people um, on the, the life of someone that you've lost. Um, there's a moment of silence. Um, the choir, the national choir comes and sings. Um, it's a really beautiful event that um, is welcome. And it's not a fundraiser for Jasmine. The, the $10 suggested donation is just a donation suggestion. It's really about giving our community a chance to honor those that have mm -hmm. gone before us. Beautiful. All right. And if people want to get yeah. involved, we have the link in our Instagram. Um, so it's at Jasmine Palliative Hospice, and you can get the Light Up a Life registration form. Mm -hmm. so the name of your loved one, we'll put it on a star. You can pick it up at the event. I highly recommend doing that. A lot of people in Cayman, <laughs> we like to wait till last minute and be like, we'll just show up. That's fine. We will have people there in the day, but it makes the event run smoother. And the, the, the time that you spend there isn't in a line, but it's sitting down mm -hmm. with family, enjoying the, the environment the, the moment. If you've pre-ordered your star ahead of time. So I really, really encourage everyone to go to our Instagram. If you can't find that, call us. We'll take your over the phone and mm -hmm. it just makes everything work smoother that night. Yes. Okay. Wonderful. So Bonnie, Miss Bonnie's here. Miss Bonnie says, good morning, Felicia. You were a tower of strength when I lost my grandson, Dimitri. Always there um, <clears throat> to help me get through my grief, keep up the good work. So that's Miss Bonnie um, from East End. Of course, we have to remember that, you know, um, it's not just about sort of older people with, you know, chronic illnesses and diseases. Sometimes it's our grandchildren, it's our children, it's younger individuals, it's babies who barely got a start in life that can be um, extremely stressful when you're having to deal with an illness for um, an infant or um, even a situation where it's a sudden death as well, right? So the support system being incredibly important. Um, Lavana is here. She says, good morning. I'm just coming on and seeing the topic. I would fully recommend Jasmine Palliative and Hospice Care. My sister spent her last days there and, um, <clears throat> and on... 
my I never felt so appreciative in my life for the care that they gave her. I went home every night and slept good knowing that she was well taken care of. Thank you, thank you, thank you a hundred times and uh, sleep in peace, Lenorcia Brown. So um, some people just giving a little bit of testament. Uh, you know, they've had the opportunity to deal with Jasmine and um, everybody just giving you guys complete props. Well, we do do that from time to time with people saying, you know, I didn't know. I, knew mm -hmm. I, I needed Jasmine in support of the person who's actually sick. So yeah. it's, um, it's really, it's lovely to, to know that we've really been able to help not just the patient, but also the family kind of go through life's toughest moments. Mm -hmm. Like Thank for you. me, I, I agree. I mean, one of the things, and, and this, this fed for the rebrand that we went, that I, and Dr. Bernard can tell you, I fought for the rebrand very hard mm -hmm. because growing up in the Cayman Islands and knowing a lot of people here um, and having more than one time someone say, well, I thought it was just for the end that that gutted me when the family member or a friend didn't call for support because they thought they didn't qualify or that they didn't need it. It mm. was, it was heartbreaking truth be told as, as a Cayman yeah. wanting to give this free service to everyone that, that needs it. Um, and so we, we rebranded so that people would see that Jasmine offered more than just the hospice palliative mm. care encompasses everything and hospice is only one part of palliative care towards right. the end. Um, and we really want to impress upon people that, you know, the caregivers, as you said, need the support, the patient needs the support, the whole family unit will function better with the support of the Jasmine team coming alongside. We've just heard that testimony where the the, the sister was blessed by the support, not just her, 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 her sister that died, but her herself being able to rest. It's a huge burden dealing with, with a chronic illness. It's a huge burden dealing with an end of life illness. And the beauty with Jasmine and the support of the community is that you don't have to do it alone. And, mm -hmm. and if, if I could, you know, impress upon my Caymanian community to pick up the phone and call when they're in doubt, don't just say, well, I got to wait for the doctor to refer. And if they haven't referred, that means they can't help. It's better to call and say, you know, we can't help this way because you're doing so well than to not call because you think you don't qualify. Right. And uh, when dealing with my patients, what I have found one of the obstacles was the fear, the fear of mm -hmm. the word hospice. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, when you tell hospice, they go Google up and then you find mm -hmm. that, okay, this is the end of the road for me. My doctor is abandoning me. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, they give up hope and they get mm -hmm. depressed. So um, I think the rebranding hand and the visibility of the positive visibility that comes with it has gone mm -hmm. a long way in reassuring the patients and their families that this is a supportive care. It's part of your journey and nobody is abandoning you. You continue your treatment mm -hmm. with the support available from the services of Jasmine. And it's a wonderful collaboration between the physician community and the team. And, uh, you know, we see the difference, like uh, the, the patients and their families, they have a lot of doubts when you first mentioned Jasmine. Um, they are mm -hmm. not aware of the services, but after a session with the nurses, it could be just a phone call, as Felicia says, you should see the difference in attitude. Mm -hmm. They are more at peace. They are encouraged by, you know, the talk and, and they know that they are not alone. That's the most important part. So it's not the end of the journey. It's a journey, but it just made more comfortable mm -hmm. and more, uh, you know, uh, 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 you know, by the services provided by Jasmine, the journey is made more uh, easier for, for the patients and their family. Mm -hmm. Wow. So someone's asking, um, what is the business model? Is, isn't palliative care like the drug and anesthetics um, expensive? So they're basically wondering how you guys make it happen. Um, Felicia. <laughs> and he's going to take that one. I'll jump in if I want to ask. Yes. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, medical care is expensive. Yes. It just is. If you've ever received a hospital bill, you know medical yeah, care is expensive. Absolutely. Um, and we're not we're not immune to that. Um, our organization typically runs about 800, 850,000 CI a year. Mm -hmm. um, and we fundraise. We fundraise um, and we do receive a wonderful grant from government. Sabrina Turner big shout out. She's a lovely supporter. Um, mm. We have lots of corporate supporters, um, families in the community that have stepped up. We have various events. Um, we receive donations through Flag Day. You mm -hmm. may have seen our people out there with the 
cans in front of all of the stores. Mm -hmm. um, you'd be surprised. Coins, little by little, those really add up and make a huge difference for us. So when we say like we've we've done this from the community for mm -hmm. the community, and we couldn't do it without the community, we're not we're not joking. This is. Mm -hmm. This is a community project, which I think is just kind of really beautiful because our our patients are necessarily pretty private. They might not tell the person on the street kind of what they're going through, mm -hmm. um, but there are so many people in Cayman who, who have supported Jasmine and have thus supported kind of strangers they don't know. Mm. And it's really, wow. really cool to see. I think it speaks to Cayman kind in general. I mean, mm -hmm. that is what it is. I mean, yeah. it, it, it's a culture. I mean, we've got a fancy word for it now, but from 22 years ago when we've started, the Cayman community has been in support of ensuring that patients don't suffer alone um, and that they have the support they need and they don't have, you know, and just because from, from when we started, it's just been one, you know, one more person by one more person understanding mm -hmm. what we do. <clears throat> wanting to ensure, even though they themselves may not need it at that point in time that they may, mm -hmm. so you're kind of paying it forward. And then when we do touch these families, families will do in memory of donations back to us, corporations that they work for may do donations back to us. And then now just growing into the corporate community even more, um, it's just continuing to get that committed giving, um, which we do struggle with. Um, and we, we worry about sometimes, I won't say a lie, it does cost a lot. So thank you for that question. Yes. Um, but we, we, we have Ansley, thankfully, and, and her assistant, Jada, who work hard to come up with new innovative ways that allow us to <clears throat> gain support, not just for the here and now, but for the long term. And we're, mm -hmm. we're blessed that we're, we're looking forward to hopefully starting an endowment program very soon, which a, a generous donor has come on board to kind of help us build so that we really can ensure that the Cayman community, like I said, doesn't just have it for the here and now, but has it for the long haul. For the long term. Yes. And of course, you know, um, the need for volunteers uh, would be something that would be worthwhile mentioning at this particular um, junction. So tell us how important volunteers are, what type of volunteers uh, you need and, um, you know, what are the things that they can do and contribute? Sure. So the biggest need for volunteers in one concentrated weekend is going to be flag day. Um, and that's in February where for two days we need something like 300 to 400 volunteers wow. um, over that weekend. And that's just taking a two hour snippets of time to stand in front of fosters or books and books and, and invite people to support Jasmine with coins, dollars, little bits and bobs, and it really adds up. Mm -hmm. um, beyond that, we have both um, kind of administrative or fundraising volunteers as well as clinical. If you've got um, time and a skill set and the heart for it, um, and that can be pretty much anything. We have um, uh, massage therapists that volunteer with us that we know that we can call on if we've got a patient mm -hmm. that needs that service. Um, we've even had people kind of just sit and listen to stories and then, you know, write down all of the stories that a, that a patient tells. Um, mm. Administrative is just, you know, we, we run our organization kind of on a shoestring, just like every other nonprofit. We all mm -hmm. wear a bunch of hats. We all um, turn to at both ends. So having that administrative support um, in the office is is amazing because then it just takes a little bit of the weight off of us that are that are in here. Mm -hmm. um, so patients, um, patient care isn't exactly something that they that someone is ready for or kind of feels like their their realm would be best used. There's always the administrative support. Mm -hmm. And just for clarification, when we say patient care, we don't expect anyone to come in and lift, turn, bathe, or change our patient. They're really right. companions. The the volunteer that goes, we call them clinical volunteers, but they they're going to go in and spend time with that family, the patient or the loved one. If you have an Alzheimer's, the patient that you're caring for, well, that, that wife or that husband is sitting alone at home with that person who maybe cannot communicate the same way. So a volunteer coming in to spend time with the, the wife makes a big difference in her day and, and, and mm -hmm. gives her the respite she needs to allow her to keep doing what she's doing, you know, that support system in place. And as Anze mentioned, you know, listening to someone's stories and being able to type it up into a story that you can give to the family is another huge one. 
um, if they paint, mm -hmm. if they, you know, the, any kind of talent that they do have and they're willing to spend time with a patient or, or their loved ones is all that it requires for clinical volunteers. And, and even when we talk to that administrative support, if you think of it, so we've got this beautiful facility, our office are kind of set back from the front door. So we have front desk volunteers who take shifts for four hours um, in the day and they come and they sit there and they'll answer the phone for us and they'll greet the people when they come through the door. It means that people get a nice welcome greeting when they come and warm welcome. And also answering the phone is huge. It keeps Ansley and I doing what we're doing without having to be interrupted for everything. And so it, every little thing that you think that we could use that helps us to keep costs down and allows us to still give amazing care is what our volunteers do for us. We could not do it without them. They make a huge, huge difference in, in just running the facility <clears throat> and ensuring that the families get that extra bit of love and attention. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. So if people would like to volunteer, how can they reach out? What's the best way? Sure. So info at jasmine.ky um, is the best way to get started. That's our email address. We also mm -hmm. have a get involved button on our website where it will take you to apply to be a volunteer. Um, it's more of just an information form as opposed to an, a proper like application where you might be rejected. Um, we're just trying to get more information about what it is that you might want to bring to the table and, and what your schedule is and, and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And, and we do have the students as well. We were really blessed this summer to have some of the high school students come and do some time at our facility. They got to learn all areas of a nonprofit. So they worked with Nancy, they worked with the, the nurses, they did some front desk, they did some inventory. Um, and we really, really love having um, our youth come and learn the importance of giving back um, and, and partnering. And we've actually currently engaged a youth person, a youth who's looking at creating what we would call, I forgot what we said we we're going to, basically it's where the youth will sit and talk with patients and kind of get their life stories and then film it and put it into something that the families can then have afterwards. But it's going to be a youth led um, kind of memorial kind of thing that they're going to do uh -huh. with the patients. And and so, yeah, we, 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 we love our volunteers. We're continuing to grow and we love our younger volunteers as well. And like you said, I mean, the importance of teaching young people from a really early age, what it means to be of service to others and the community, you know, enough can't be said for that. I mean, I remember as young as like middle school, you know, going to the, um, the uh, sort of, I know old folks home isn't the right word for it, but you the know, pines? Sort of, but, yeah, in the, but in the state, so it was, it was very okay. different. It was in the pines, but same you know, we would nursing home. Read, a nursing home. Nursing home. Yes, there you go. We would read to them. Um, and you know, some of my most fond memories came from sitting down. There was a, a gentleman one day. Um, so we would take the newspaper and we'd read to them and just tell them stories about our lives and like listen to them and stuff as well. So one day I was there with the paper and I was reading and reading and reading and spent my entire hour of volunteer time with this older um gentleman. And then at the end, like we we're getting to wrap up and I was like, okay, you know, it was so nice spending time with you today. And then he said to me, um, cause he was there just quietly listening the entire time. And he said, Oh, um, just, just hold on a second, honey. Let me put in my hearing aid. So the whole time, <laughs> not a hair word. I, said. <laughs> so I was just like, maybe this was just a moment, an hour of peace and quiet for him. <laughs> <laughs> and then I got to talk as much as I wanted to. And he wasn't bothered one way or the other because the hearing aids were not in. Um, but, you know, I will always remember that story because it was just such a funny moment of how, you know, our elders can be. <laughs> you know, just that day, he literally could not hear me. Um, and then sometimes, you know, there are programs with um, taking pets into the nursing homes and allowing, you know, elderly people to spend some time with as uh, smaller animals and stuff as well. So I think that, um, you know, volunteerism enough can't be said. And I know sometimes as Caymanians, we kind of think, oh, that's for other people to do. Um, other people who are trying to get residency or status or whatever, we kind of leave it to them. But I really want to encourage um, Caymanians to step up to the plate and to demonstrate, as Felicia said, that element of Caymankind, because a lot of times we, are on the receiving end of the benefits of these nonprofit organizations. And no matter what you have and what you don't have, there's always something you can give back by way of volunteerism. So, mm -hmm. you know, you can just read to someone that just takes a little bit of your time. If you're not working and you're not employed and you can't give financially, 
Uh, there's time that you can give, which is the most precious commodity. And, um, you know, just, just so, so many other things. So reach out to organizations such as Jasmine to see, you know, how they can utilize you and, um, you know, your services and what you bring to the table. So Lavana, um, oh, sorry, Miss Morna says, good morning, Felicia. You are truly um, blessed. You were with me when Billy Miles uh, was in your care. Thanks again to you and your staff. Uh, Miss Lavana says yes, because she was very uncomfortable in the hospital, referring to her sister. Dr. Carmen Martinez recommended to take her there. And I too thought it was only for cancer patients. I then learned more about it uh, when we went there and she was so comfortable. It was um, in peace. It's a beautiful place. Miss Joyce Ann says, um, good morning at Miss uh, Camille Pearson, mother's funeral on Sunday. She recommended Jasmine and said that they're the best and gave them a rating above and beyond. So lots of people singing the praises of um, this wonderful organization this morning, this NPO, Jasmine. Miss Juanita says, good morning, Sandy and guests. Uh, Felicia, you are an angel sent from heaven. I would like to thank you so much for the home visits for my sister, Helen. At the time we needed help, Jasmine wasn't around, I don't think. So, but I want to thank you and thank you for your help. Um, you are a Cayman in kind. Always keep up the good work and uh, what you do to help everyone. God bless you. Wonderful messages this morning. Aww. Michelle says, thank you to Dr. Benoit and Jasmine for all that you did for my husband. Thankfully, um, thankful and grateful forever to them. Some amazing messages here this morning. You guys must get a little bit teary eyed sometimes. Miss <laughs> um, Ann, just tuning in. Not sure what's being discussed. So, Ms. Ann, we're here with Jasmine. They have a little bit of time left with us about the wonderful, um, you know, services that they offer in the areas of palliative care. And um, World Hospice Day was recently, um, World Hospice and Palliative Care Day was recently observed. So just telling people a little bit, Ms. Ann, about what those uh, sort of areas entail and what Jasmine does here uh, in the Cayman Islands. So, uh, Ms. Joyce, I love these kind of programs. Um, it is an eye opener for those of us that don't know. So wonderful. And I want to thank Cal City as well, because, you know, normally they're here. <clears throat> this is their hour. And sometimes what they do is they actually donate their time to some of the NPOs and nonprofit organizations that they work with so that they can get the much needed exposure so that people can learn about these organizations and the important role that they play in the community. Ansley? Hey, Sandy, real quick. Uh, do you think you guys would like a tour of the facility? Why not? You're on mobile? Show <laughs> us. Yes, I love it. Get a, a live tour. A live all tour. Years. All right. And they can always it's see it on, on the website as well. So that's just a little meeting area for our yes. nursing team. Yeah. Sorry, we've got yeah. our nurses here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and so we really try to make sure the facility is a home. This is the yes. kitchen that the patients Beautiful. are able um, to use. The internet might have might have started to drop out just a little yes. bit. There. But um, Felicia, when when did this new facility open? By the way, I remember it's been a couple so, of years. Yeah. Now. 2019. This is three years. Wow. We're in now, almost four. We were blessed to have. Um, the now king, then um, Prince Charles and, and Camilla come and visit. And we were blessed mm -hmm. to have Camilla, the, um, the Duchess of Cornwall, now I queen consort, uh, actually opened the facility for us. Um, oh, wow. And it, it just helped us with our whole rebrand and the launch of the facility. I think we might not have had as much publicity as we had with that for people to really see the facility. And so mm -hmm. our inpatient residents that you're going to see now, in the past, we probably averaged about six patients for the whole year that mm -hmm. needed inpatient care. And within our first six months, we doubled that. Wow. It's been amazing to see people be thankful for this welcoming space mm -hmm. that she's showing you. And it's um, beautiful. It is very beautiful. You should come see it in person. It's really, yes. this, this video won't do it justice, but it's a warm, welcoming place. The family members can stay with their loved one um, overnight on a, on a pullout bed. Um, each room is, is it's, it's a single room, so they get that mm. room to themselves. They've got their own bathroom and they've got their own balcony um, porch that they can kind of go out and enjoy if they wanted to. Um, mm -hmm. And we, we did our best to make it as homely as possible. There's also a living room in the in the main area that has a TV mm -hmm. that Logic donates um, free Wi-Fi and, and, and cable for. 
And so mm -hmm. families can actually come and sit back and relax. We've had a gentleman that was losing his wife and his buddy brought a six pack of beer and they kind of had that and enjoyed it. And so it was a real moment that they could just be themselves and get that break in, a, in an area where it's safe. Because when they do come into Jasmine facility, mm -hmm. we do 24 hour care. So it takes the burden off of the family. It provides right. that respite or that support they need. Here's the um the family room that we we're talking about. It has a massage chair, the sofa, oh, wow. and just just nice and and warm. And we say, make our house your house. That's yeah. our motto when they come in, and we treat the loved ones like kings and queens. So I remember another family member mm -hmm. who brought her husband, and she wished she came sooner because you imagine sitting in a hospital room on you know, the chair, the bells, the whistles, and everything going off. It's not quite the same. And so when they came in, we were like, put your feet up. You want some tea? We just catered to the wife. Um, mm -hmm. And that's something that the hospital doesn't have the time to do. So when we can right. offer that to patients and families, it's a huge burden off of their shoulders and then still ensuring their, their families get the amazing care. I will mention that inpatient care does cost us quite a bit more. And as that mm -hmm. service continues to grow, we're, we're yet again charged with looking for new innovative ways to ensure mm -hmm. that families can get that support if they need it. Um, but it's definitely worth it for sure. Wow. So Lavana says it has a home feel not like a hospital. Um, Ms. Ann says, thanks for the service, love and care you all provide. And again, Ms. Joyce Ann, just really um, enjoying uh, the program this morning. Says, thanks for these helpful programs to make sure that we see where help is needed. So thank you um, so much, Ansley, for that uh, impromptu tour. It looks beautiful. I, I must admit that I haven't been to your facility. Um, and I, I'm not sure what I was expecting, but it wasn't that. <laughs> so it, looks, it looks amazing. It really looks amazing. It's better um, in person. Come visit. Yes. I think we, we will stop by. Wow. Good stuff. So folks, 936-2626. We have a few more minutes left in the program if you have any questions. So there's a number of fundraising events. Again, um, Jasmine, you know, does such amazing work in the community, but they do require volunteers, they have their fundraising events. So this is now where we all need to step up to the plate and try to um, assist as much as possible. So I see here that um, <clears throat> you, you know, people can volunteer, they can, you know, read a book, they can walk pets, they can go shopping um, for people or just keep them company talking. Um, there's, you know, no nursing duties expected um, for the volunteers necessarily, but, you know, just other things, so many other things that you can do. And there's also administrative and other volunteers that can be utilized. Um, so you can help to man the front desk, running errands, assisting with the preparation of fundraising events. So I know that putting on an event, um, Ansley, who's the marketing and fundraising manager, requires all hands on deck. And it really does take a lot <laughs> to make an event successful. So if you are good at organizing and making phone calls, at, you know, helping to pick up printing materials or whatever, um, <clears throat> you can be utilized in the admin role, um, maybe to help with some of the upcoming fundraising events and stuff as well to um, we assist either during or together. before or after an event. We've also had like um, students or kids decide they want to do their own fundraisers. Um, oh. and, you know, maybe have a bake sale or a clothing exchange, um, and then have that benefit Jasmine. And they, they oh, yes. a of... She's moving around. The signal um, is picking up two different Wi-Fi's. Yeah. Yeah. So that's okay. <laughs> um, yeah, no, that's, that's a fantastic idea. So a lot of schools might be looking for beneficiaries. Um, you know, for some of the dress down days or events or whatever that they do. So folks, um, definitely keep Jasmine in mind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Miss Joyce Ann says, may God continue to bless you all. You have a special gift and it takes people that love to do uh, these kind acts when people are um, at their worst. Uh, Miss Ann says, very, very beautiful. Now we need such a place to care for our mentally um, and addicts, <laughs> loved ones, when some family members are not able to care for them. Um, she says, Jamaica is not the answer. So yeah. I know um, that the mental health facilities soon come. I, I think Dr. Lacard has definitely fought that battle along with um, the support group. And I know they're actively building a facility, which I hear mm -hmm. is amazing. So I look forward to seeing that as well. Yeah, absolutely. All right, ladies. Well, thank you so much uh, for coming on the program. Really, really appreciate learning a bit more um, about Jasmine. And um, Dr. Vanitha, thank you also 
for coming on. She sits on the Jasmine board. Do you need any board members or are you pretty good at the board? Oh, I'm, we're, we're good at the board level, but you know, yeah. there's always an opportunity to join on one of our subcommittee city committees. So there's a fundraising subcommittee. There's a building subcommittee. Um, mm -hmm. There, there are lots of different subcommittees that maybe may fit your fancy. And then that may be a trek towards the board at the end of the day that uh -huh. if you, you know, were serving that committee and then a vacancy came in play, you're already connected to Jasmine, which would then help you to trend up that way. Um, and we definitely could use more fundraising volunteers, building committee volunteers. I know nothing about running a facility. And so that committee really supports me as we continue to grow and expand our facility to meet the need that we currently have. Mm -hmm. So yeah, lots of opportunities. Just tell them to reach out if they're interested in volunteering joining a subcommittee of the board, um, want to make a donation, whatever it is, as, as we've seen from the amazing testimonies. And, and I do get teary eyed because it, for me, it's always like I get my flowers now, you know, that kind of thing, like mm -hmm. not, not afterwards. I hear of, of the, the benefits that the service that we provide has made for people. And that makes it all worthwhile and makes you want to keep doing it. So I'm very grateful for the support that we have um, without the support of the community, we would not be able to do what we do. So thanks to Health mm -hmm. City for this spot and the, the allowing us to publicize more about who we are and what we do through this, so, this medium. And we just look forward for more opportunities to ensure everyone knows who we are and what we do. Mm -hmm. Absolutely wonderful. All right, ladies, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Have a fantastic day. Um, again, folks, volunteerism is the way to go. It's the way to, to live your life, being of service to other people. So please do give them a call um, or email them over at Jasmine and they'd be more than happy um, to speak to you about the different volunteer opportunities. Thank you very much. We've got uh, Ms. Felicia, who is the Thank Director you. of Operations and Nursing at Jasmine. We've got Ansley, who is the Marketing and Fundraising Manager and Dr. Vanitha, who is a Consultant Medical Oncologist at Health City and also a Jasmine board member. I'm going to come and see you soon, Felicia. Yay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. All right, folks. Um, and don't forget that this is October, which is Breath, Breast Cancer Awareness Month. <clears throat> so, of course, we want to encourage everyone to schedule and get your mammograms done. Really, really important. And you know that Health City is offering a special $150 US during the month of October, where you can go ahead and do your breast cancer screening, mammography screening. That's a reduced cost um, in observance of Breast Cancer Awareness Month. So folks, go ahead and get it done. The cost uh, does not cover any additional screenings or follow-up, but you know sometimes all you need is that mammography to know that you're good. Please, folks, I encourage all women um, and men to do your breast self-examinations and to also um, have your mammograms done. And this is available at the facility in Health City. Consultation with one of their specialists, um, which is going to take place also at the facility in East End or the Kimana Bay Clinic. Our patients can opt for a virtual consultation as well, is also included and available. So um, this is fantastic. So get your mammography, 525-8871 is the phone number, or you can email breastclinic at healthcity.ky. And just remember that you've got to book your appointments and they have to be completed in the month of October to qualify for this promotional rate of $150 USD. So listen, let's take a commercial break and then we're gonna come back and talk about all the court news that happened yesterday and what else is happening in the community. Cause like I said, Cayman is small, but a lot is always going on. So here's a word from um, Wonderland Christmas. Uh, Christmas trees, believe it or not, are on their way. They have to get here early. Uh, for you to have time to decorate and put them up with your families. And, you know, you want to have a good pick of the litter, so to speak, when it comes to Christmas trees. You don't want to be that person on Christmas Eve running around like a chicken without a head uh, trying to secure a Christmas tree. Because by then, folks, it's too late. Get your Christmas tree early. It's the thing I love about Wonderland, I got a tree from them last year, is that they actually deliver. They do home delivery and it was fantastic. You know, we got to choose what height we kind of wanted based on the space that we have available. And so there are limited options. I know that everything has been in short supply over the last few years, including Christmas trees. So get your Christmas trees early, folks. Um, call, reserve the size that you want. And here's a brief message from them. Wonderland Christmas trees are here. It's official. It's Cayman's most wonderful time of the year. Don't delay or all the elves will give the trees away. 
Stop by our Christmas tree lot to select from the finest balsam fir trees, starting at $100 for 5 to 6 feet. Christmas lot is located right next to Costulus and Governor Square. Selected from the best farms in Canada, your tree has been grown with love and care by all our elves for many years. Wonderland Christmas Trees is owned and operated by experienced elves with over 6 years of industry experience. Don't trust your Christmas tree needs to anyone else. And remember, for every tree you purchase, Wonderland Christmas Trees makes a donation to feed our future and Meals on Wheels. Visit wonderlandtrees.ky or find us on Facebook to place your order today. Christmas tree sales going on now. Don't delay. Wonderland Christmas Trees, your best choice for Christmas. Ho, 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 ho. Merry Christmas. Uh, Christmastrees.ky is the address. Um, trees starting at just $110 and going up from there. Pretty reasonably priced. But before we get to Christmas, you know we got Halloween coming first. So <laughs> my daughter this year has, um, gosh, she's at that age already where she's like, okay, I don't want to be a princess anymore. I don't want to be a fairy. I don't want to be frozen Elsa or whatever else. Hmm. Guess what she wants to be this year? I'm going to make this a trivia question today. Nine, um, three, six, two, six, two, six. Guess what she wants to be for Halloween while you're thinking about it. The, um, folks over at home gas put on a wonderful event every single year. I think they might've taken a little break because of COVID, but they have a haunted house event, which is a lot of fun, age appropriate, of course, you know, what kids you can take. Um, but I can tell you I have been, and I've had a little bit of a scare going through the haunted house, but it was well put together, very well organized. Um, it's a fun time for so many people uh, in the family and in the community. And the best part about it is it's actually a fundraising event for a lot of NPOs. So check this out. Ooh. Oh gosh, my apologies. That's <laughs> that is not the right song at all. I was like, wait a minute, that's not Halloween. This should be Nightmare in the Waterfront. Home Gas presents Nightmare on the Waterfront. Four nights of frights and horror in Cayman's only nightmare haunted house. Watch your back as you make your way through terrifying moments and nightmare scares at every turn. In partnership with Sandbar, Tortuga, McAlpine, and featuring Lost Tortuga's Pirates, 100% of proceeds will be donated to local charities. Visit nightmare.ky for more. Mm-hmm. That looks like that's going to be fun. All right, folks. Good morning to Ms. Bula. Good morning to Ms. Debbie. James is here watching from Canada. <laughs> Brenda said she wants to go as her mom for Halloween. No, she's not really thinking on that level yet. <laughs> I don't think I don't think she understands, Ms. Brenda, that her mom might be a terror sometimes or a character. Um, although it's so funny because a lot of times we go out and people be like, hey, Miss Sandy. And they'll say, hi, Gigi. And she's like, how did these people know my name, mom? Like, how did they know me? And I said, oh, I said, one day you'll understand. Richard is guessing a mermaid. No, she does not want to be a mermaid this year. Soka is guessing that she wants to be a witch. Nope, not a witch. 936 26, 26. Come on now. You guys need to think about this. Um, what does Gianna want to be for Halloween this year? Um, Miss Morna says, Sandy, I get my Christmas trees from South Sound and get some sand from the beach. Laughing out loud, old time Christmas, just saying. Are there any trees like that left in South Sound? Um, I'd be surprised if there are. But at the end of the day, um, leave what's there. These are imported from Canada. <laughs> and eventually, I think they're made into mulch and stuff. So um, I would say, um, you know, leave, leave what's there, y'all. All right, so um, good morning. Ooh, we have somebody who's going to guess what she wants to be for Halloween this year. Good morning, caller. Hello. Hello. What do you think it is? I think she wants to be something to do with a lizard or a frog or something. No, although she does like lizards and frogs. Um, nope. Somebody else is guessing a mermaid. Um, no, some good guesses so far, but no one's, no one's hitting it right on the head. Think of something, right. um, more on the lines of, 
I don't want to give it away. You guys just keep guessing. You'll you'll eventually get it. Hmm. I've already ordered the costume. Somebody said she wants to be an angel. No, it's nothing nice like an angel or princess this year. That's what I'm telling you. It's a big um, switch up. <laughs> Jonathan has a funny one. <laughs> Jonathan says a big microphone um, is on her mama. So her mama can talk into it. <laughs> No, uh, Miss Debbie's guessing the newest trend Barbie, a ghost. Uh, Mallory is closer than anybody else has probably been. So Mallory says a zombie. Very close, Mallory. Uh, Miss Jackie is guessing a talk show host like her mom. No, she doesn't even know. She doesn't even know that's a thing yet. Uh, Debbie is guessing it came on turtle. You know, at first she was kind of saying she wanted to be a pumpkin, but then that changed a superhero. Aha. Akina got it. She wants to be a vampire. Akina, congratulations. I'm going to give you a gift certificate to waffle monkey so you can go by and enjoy. So, um, Anthony was thinking a mummy. Debbie was guessing a ghost. Tammy said a ghost or a pirate. No, she wants to be a vampire this year. And she was very, very specific. Like, we need to get vampire teeth and the works. So, Akina, congratulations. Please WhatsApp us your um, contact number so that um, we can get that done. Get that gift certificate and stuff sorted out for you. Joy Sam was thinking a wizard. Hmm. Some good guesses. Um, so no, she wants to be a vampire this year. So we went on Amazon and we got her little vampire outfit all sorted out. 93626, um, uh, Akina, message us so we can get you all sorted out. All right. So yes, that's what she's going to be. And uh, we ordered it and hopefully a friend is going to bring it for us um, just in time for Halloween. So I don't know if I'm going to dress up this year. I'm so a little bit. Like, you know, we obviously have to go and do the whole trick-or-treating thing with her. Um, so maybe I'll put on a costume. I'm not sure. I don't know yet. I'm seeing. So Corrine says a vampire. Wow, I know. I was like, are you sure you don't want to be a princess? She's like, no. <laughs> I was like, okay. Uh, it must have been one of those YouTube videos because she's like, oh, and can I get um, contacts? And I said, no, <laughs> you can't get contacts. She doesn't even know what contact. I'm like, contacts? I said, no. <clears throat> and then she's like, well, what are contacts anyway? And I said, well, uh, something that children don't need to know anything about. Um, so did you see that really weird story about a physician who was talking about how they removed 23 contacts from somebody's eyes? I haven't even read the story yet. I just saw the headline. And all I could do was shake my head. Like, I can't even imagine how that's possible. How do you have 23 contacts in your eyes? Like, how long did you uh, leave those in for? That's disgusting. Oh, my God. So Sauce Sweet says, where do they do trick-or-treating? Well, there's a number of places here on the island that are very, you know, safe community zones. So Webster Estate will be opening up the gate. I think this is the first time since COVID, since the pandemic. So they will be opening up their gate, and you can go there. Um, a lot of the homes participate, and they hand out candy. And they go all over board as a community, like the entire community of Webster States really gets into it. They decorate their homes. Some people actually have Halloween parties and they invite you inside, honey chow. This is Cayman Kind, trust me. Only in the Cayman Islands as a total stranger say, come on in, enjoy your Halloween party, you know, and they'll have snacks and lots of fun stuff going on uh, for the kids. So um, I like Webster's Estates. I think it's a good, because you just kind of do the loop, do the circle, and then you're done. Like you've got way more than enough you know, chocolate. And because it is a neighborhood event, 99% of the homes, like everybody gets into it. <clears throat> People hand out the chocolates and whatever. And then there's also like Snug Harbor. Um, they do, I think one that's like pretty well received and stuff as well. Kimana Bay tends to be a safe haven for children to go. And, you know, a lot of the businesses there will hand out chocolate, especially the younger kids. They can go a little bit early. And they'll hand out um, candy and stuff to them as well. So a couple um, really good areas. Um, Savannah area done, down Jason Street. I know Miss Heather and her family, uh, Heather Bodner in that area. And they tend to do, um, you know, lots of fun activities there as well. So Soka says, that's what Halloween is all about. No pretty costumes. 
um, that started for commercial reasons. Uh, Teresa, good morning to you. So nice to see you here. Just Brenda said Savannah just by um, MP Heather. Yes, um, I was just saying that one as well. Mm -hmm. So lots of really wonderful Halloween events coming up for um, for the end of the month. So yeah, you know, it's tricky though, because when you have a six-year-old that already has a sweet tooth, the last thing you want is to get all this Halloween candy. So what we did last year is we have some friends. Um, they're seven-day Adventists, so I don't know that they did Halloween. I can't remember. But basically, we divide up the candy and share it with other older kids um, as well. So she'll get to keep a few pieces that she can eat in the coming months, not all at once. Oh, the struggle is real. And then we share the candy for kids who may not, for whatever reason, have had an opportunity to get out there. So Soka says the best costumes were grandpa and grandma clothes with big bonkies and boobies, bubbies. <laughs> oh my gosh. All right. So speaking of nightmares um, and traumatic situations, let's talk about court yesterday. What a nightmare. O-M-G. Well, yes. Oh, some other people on WhatsApp were guessing vampire as well. Um, <clears throat> all right. So listen, oh my gosh. Where do I begin with yesterday's court proceedings? Okay, well, let's start at the top. Um, I do have my notes. I think I, I feel like I need to get my, my laptops with my notes because I don't really want to miss anything that was said. Um, so give me a second here. Let me um, let me let me grab my laptop because honey, chill. Y'all need to y'all need to hear this. Like seriously, I there were times in the proceeding that my my mouth was like dropping. Mm -mm -mm. Let's play um, the labor force survey. Um, someone said, why these people are at my door again? I said, listen, this is a different survey from the ESO. Just participate in the survey. Um, because really and truly it is important information that they're trying to gather. This one is specific to the labor force here in the Cayman Islands. The fall labor force survey is currently being conducted by the economics and statistics office. The labor force survey collects data on employed and unemployed persons. Train interviewers with ESO ID cards will visit randomly selected households in all districts. The interviewers will exercise appropriate COVID-19 protocols using personal protective equipment. The interviews are confidential in accordance with the statistics. Act. No individual data will be published or disclosed. Survey data are exempt from freedom of information. For more details, please call the ESO hotline at 516-3329. All right, folks. Um, right, so I'm just pulling up my laptop here, honey. Yeah. So we went to court. They didn't start on time, which was okay. Um, I don't really know what the delay was, but it could have been. I mean, the witnesses were there. The defendant was there. I think it's just one of those situations where, you know, the judge must have been doing um, something else. And so <clears throat> got started a little bit late. Uh, most of us don't mind that because we were oftentimes rushing to try to get parking and any event to be able to, you know, get in there and listen to the proceedings. So it was in courtroom four. Now somebody was asking me, where's courtroom four? Where courtroom was four is over by the, um, that's the old Kirk building. So that has now been taken over. Um, has government purchased that building? I don't know if they purchased it yet, but they might as well because they've been in there forever. That courtroom seven is like downstairs. They've got the cashier's office. And then around the corner, <clears throat> On the kind of like across the Burger King side is courtroom four. And then there's a courtroom upstairs, which is five. And there are judges chambers and offices and stuff um, in that building. There's also the civil registry that is housed in that building as well. And this, this week, they're actually painting a few buildings in town. I don't know if you guys saw this or not. But um, they're painting uh, the, which one? Oh, yes, the post office is getting painted. They've already power washed it. 
and it looks like they're they're also like stripping it down some more. And the courthouse is getting painted as well. So the staff over at the courthouse, especially in criminal registry, I understand is temporarily moved over by civil registry side uh, while this um, maintenance work is undertaken. So anyway, we went to court. Uh, it finally got started. The prosecution had three witnesses that they were calling. All three witnesses were called yesterday. Now, you know, I'm there making observations about everything as well as um, taking my notes. I want to take very, very detailed notes so I can bring you guys the source and exactly what happened. And also making some interesting notations like mental notations. So what did I find uh, right away that I thought was particularly interesting? Well, a couple of things. Um, <clears throat> the first one was the um, only person there to support the defendant, other than her lawyer, obviously, who's being paid to do a job, was her mom. Not a single member of the committee was there. Now, I suppose in their heads, they're probably thinking, well, <clears throat> if I showed up, maybe people would say, you know, are you guys supporting her? Why are you here? I thought that they would have been there just for the sake of hearing the witnesses and deciphering for themselves who they believe and what it is that they're going to believe, right? Because <clears throat> I've said this before, Miss k -Man has expressed to them certain things that she claims has happened in her defense, right? She has essentially told them that she's the victim and that she was assaulted by these individuals and everything that she did in response, all these so-called, you know, injuries from her perspective, and they're not so-called, they're actually real injuries. We saw photos. I mean, the, the court saw photos and everything, right? That, um, you know, all of this is an over-exaggeration on the part of the victims and the victims were the aggressors. So that's part of her defense. Another part of her defense, which played very, very heavily yesterday, was her mental health. Okay, and I'm going to tell you kind of why I say that here in a second. So the first witness um, up is the um, <clears throat> victim number one, who is the father of the young man that she'd been dating. So here's what we know. And, and don't confuse, because a lot of people are confusing situations. They were like, oh, you know, this was another case. No, she's she's had this exact same MO happen on more than one occasion. When I said exact same, what I mean is dating a guy, relationship ends, and then they get physically assaulted. This was um, a totally different situation than the others that we know about, including the one that resulted in uh, police having to... Um, <clears throat> police having to do like a standoff with her, almost like a hostage situation, except I guess she was the hostage of herself. Anywho, um, so there is a reporting restriction in place. I can't say much about it, obviously, because there's a reporting restriction. But all I will say is that apparently she must be running another line of defense that if she takes a stand once the defense, because the defense case hasn't been brought yet, that she's going to come up and say, oh, something else happened. And we have been instructed by the court that we can't report on it. So this is very, very interesting, right? Courts are open to the public. So you can come and you can sit down and you can listen to the evidence and you can hear, you know, whatever. But there are certain things that you will hear in court that can't be reported on. Now, that I'm sure you guys are thinking that's weird because you must be like, well, it's open court. So if I wanted to hear it, I could come and sit there and hear it anyway. Yes, but we we still have um, some reporting restrictions. And this is one of them that was put in place yesterday. That's all I can say about it. Um, you know, we haven't heard that defense yet. We kind of know um, the general nature of, of what it is. But, you know, I can't really get into it except to say that if it comes up, it's not something that we can report in any event. Which is kind of weird. All right. October the 15th, 2021. So this is like nightmare on, I don't know, whatever street, nightmare in West Bay, okay? So this is how the nightmare situation starts out. The man is sitting at home um, around 10 o'clock at night, watching TV, 
And I could, I could visualize as the prosecution was asking him questions and he was describing what was, you know, I could, I could visualize this, you know, you're sitting at home 10 o'clock at night. For me, the alarm is already on 10 o'clock at night. Nobody's coming to bang at my door at that hour. I even thought when Gianna's like in her twenties, if she's still living at home, you know, somebody comes banging at my door, am I going to open the door? No, I'm going to be talking to them. This is where y'all need to get y'all a little ring doorbell or some kind of security camera. I'm going to press that button and say, may I help you? Okay, what do you need? Because here's the most interesting part. About two weeks before this, there was an incident that happened with her and some phone where she took the boyfriend, the ex-boyfriend's phone and wouldn't return it. She was at the residence. And at that point, she was refusing to leave. So the father said to his son, she's no longer welcome here. And I can't say that I necessarily blame him because he said that, you know, um, he could see where this was headed for trouble. And um, she was refusing to leave the residence on the last occasion that they had some sort of an altercation. So his position was, do not bring her back to this house. She's no longer welcome here, whatever. But it does seem like the um, the victim, the young man and her, were still in communication. You know, these phones, honey, chill. These WhatsApp messages. So they were still talking at some level. Now, she actually messaged his son to say that she was coming over. And the son said to his dad, um, dad, Tiffany just messaged to say that she's coming over. And of course, you know that the dad has already said she's no longer invited. Um, she can no longer be a guest in her home. So the dad was like, oh, um, that's it came across nice in court. But as someone who has read the court files, what I know that she actually said, and I guess, you know, certain things come out in, in court evidence. But in the statements, what she actually said is, I'm coming the F over. And if you don't open that effing door, I'm going to beat you up. That's that's kind of, that was her, that was her attitude before she even got there. Like, you better open the door or else. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh-huh. I read the statements, honey, chill. So I'm telling you a little bit of the background information. So I was like, ooh, honey, chill. She is, mm, mm, mm. Anyway. She comes over and she starts banging down the door. Imagine it. Boom, boom, boom. And the man says, the father says, you know, 50% of the door is like glass. You know, one of those doors that has a lot of glass in it. And so he was afraid that she was going to break the glass. You know how hard somebody has to be banging on something for you to, um, to be afraid that they're actually going to break the glass in the door? That, that's, that's some force, okay? So he opened the door in order to prevent her from breaking the glass. And he stood in the doorway, still not welcoming her in and saying, you know, you can't come in here. And she tried to force her way in. And of course he's trying to prevent her with his body from coming in the door. Then he says that she got, he got punched. Hold on now. Let me, let me go through my little evidence here, my evidence notes. Um, right. So he said he was apprehensive. It was a term that he used about her coming over because two weeks prior she had resisted leaving the residence and when she did, she took the young man's phone, some phone. Um, mind you, this is a three-month relationship. Keep that in the back of your heads, right? Um, so he said that um, he had made it clear to his son that she was not allowed in his house ever again. His quotes, extremely loud banging on the door. And since there's this glass pane in the door itself, he was very, very concerned that she was going to break the glass, open the door. She's belligerent. This is a quote, belligerent, hostile, and threatening were the three words that he used to describe her immediate behavior. And she was shouting for the son to come out. Mm -hmm. Now, I imagine that the son was actually upstairs um, hiding out and he was scared to death, <laughs> you know, that, oh my God, this woman's downstairs yelling and screaming and whatever, but it gets far worse. This was just the beginning of the nightmare on whatever street. Okay. Um, he says that he immediately asked her to leave. She tried to push her way past him to get into the house. And when unable to do so, she took a step back and struck him in the face. Mm, mm, mm. Lord Jesus, what a mess. Um, so I guess he was shocked by that strike physically and, and, you know, figuratively. And he doesn't even remember. He said he can't remember if it was a, a, a open face slap, a closed face, 
left hand, right hand? Because, you, you know, they're always like, well, what hand did she hit you with? You know, when you're in a situation like this, let's be honest, afterwards, you don't remember all of those details. You're just like, all I know is I was stunned when I just got a box across my face. Was it like, uh, you know, five pound box, a 10 pound box? All he knows is she stepped back. Now, you know, when somebody steps back and then boxes you, that's a proper box. I mean, I'm sorry to say, but that comes with, you know, some force behind it. Otherwise, you don't step back. You just like, like slap the person. You don't need to step back for that. This was a box that really shocked the man for real, right? She stepped back. And as, as Kay Mannions would say, she put her back into that box. Yeah. All right. Anyway, um, he said that the box actually knocked his glasses off of his face. That's how hard it was. So again, that was a no little pion, pion, slap or whatever. This was a proper box in the face. Jim is here. Good morning. Jim says trespassing and assault. Oh, yes, honey child. Definitely assault. Without a doubt. Yes. So anyway, uh, knocks the force of it knocks the glasses off of his face. Um, he said that he was begging her. She, she then picked up his glasses and she was beg. He was begging her because that was his only pair of like prescription reading glasses. And he was begging her to please just give me my glasses back. Now, this was an image. I must tell you that when he was describing this in my mind's eye, I could literally envision what he was saying, right? So he said what she did, she picked up the glasses and he's begging, um, please just give me, Tiffany, I can, you know, we're going to do a little reenactment here. Um, Tiffany, please just give me my glasses back. You know, let me have my glasses. Just give me my glasses, please, Tiffany. She did this. This is his testimony in court yesterday. She held up the glasses, looking him, this is what he said, looked me dead in the eyes and with both hands, right, bent and crumbled them up and threw them on the ground. Oh my God. So this is how it went down, folks. Picks up the glasses and he's begging and pleading. She's ignoring him. She holds them up, looking him in the eye. Now, you know when people make eye contact with you? During an altercation, things are serious, honey child. Let me take out my glasses so that I can show y'all. You know, looking you in the eye, mm, making strong eye contact with you. Take the glasses and then bends them and crumbles them up. Boom, drops them on the ground. Like that is the biggest F you that you could probably have gotten in that moment. She's like, there you go. There's your glasses that you're begging for. Mm-mm-mm. Jeez, some peace. So destroyed the man's glasses. I don't know how much it costs to replace them, but they had the invoice. Um, and pretty much the prosecution, the defense is accepting that she destroyed the glasses, but I'm going to tell you kind of how they tried to twist it when on cross-examination. And this is what lawyers get paid to do, honey child. They get paid to twist the truth in every which way, right? So he then stepped forward to retrieve his glasses and he got punched in the head. Now, this punch seems to have been something, um, if he didn't remember the first punch, he definitely remembered this one because he described this as a punch in the head, closed fist punch in the head, right? As he was trying to get his glasses, he then says that he was taken aback. Um, they were shouting at this point. He picked up his glasses and he immediately called 911. The other thing is, this is a, a, an aside note. We don't name victims normally. Um, occasionally we do. So for example, you know, the other case we're going to talk about here with the guy who was convicted and sentenced to 25 months for assaulting this woman. She has come forward as the victim who wants to tell her story as a cautionary tale to um, other people, right? She has been willing to be identified. Not every victim wants to be identified. But let me try to describe this man. He's in his 50s, um, a business owner, you know, very, very active in the community. Not super soft-spoken, but not an aggressive personality. Soft-spoken enough, you know, Caymanian, multi-generational Caymanian. <sighs> He 
is the type of person who is very progressive thinking, you know, like a liberal for the environment and all this other stuff, women's rights. So one of the things he said, which I thought was very, very interesting, he says, I was extremely conscious of the situation of having two men in one woman trying to restrain her from striking us again while reasoning with her to leave. So think about that for a second. Here's a guy who is concerned not just about him and his son, but also concerned about, you know, this, the, the optics of this. This even looks bad to say, oh, two women, you know, against one, two men, sorry, against one woman. And he could see immediately what her narrative could be, which is exactly what she has done. She has, in her defense, um, come out having her lawyer ask questions about, well, that's not what happened, is it? This is the alternative. And he stood his ground. He's like, that's not what happened. <laughs> Your alter it's a complete fabrication, right? We'll talk about that here in a second. But he said that he was trying to do things like he called 911. So a lot of the assault was actually captured on the 911 phone call and the call to the police, right? And him and his son were, because at some point the son comes downstairs, they're handing the phone back and forth to each other. Like, okay, this is what she's doing now. Like they were really, really keen to try to um, be as like hands off because she's going to now accuse them of all sorts of grievances and she was just defending herself. And if you know this individual, you would know that like he's, he's definitely that kind of person, right? Who's going to be like, I'm going to restrain her just so she doesn't continue to assault me, but I'm not trying to hit her. I'm not trying to punch her. They're like the tree loving, um, tree hugging kind of people in the community, right? Very, very peaceful individuals. You know, if she's having a mental health break, let's just, you know, just try to get her out of here and stop having her beat us up. Keep that in your mind because I'm going to tell you something else that happened here in a second. So then he shouts for the neighbor um, to come out and help him. It's actually an apartment complex. So when I first heard that he shouted for the neighbor, when I read the statement, I'm like, well, where, where, which neighbor was the, which yard was the neighbor in? But it was like an apartment complex. So you don't have to shout that far, I guess, for your neighbors to hear you. She, he shouted for the neighbor to come out so that the neighbor could then witness some of what had gone down um, again. So that when she tries to twist the narrative, it's not, uh, people know that's not actually what happened, right? So he says that he was able to grab a hold of her arms and tried to restrain her arms so that she could stop um, hitting him. And it was at that point that she actually headbutted him. Oh my God. Have you ever headbutted somebody before? I have never headbutted anybody in my life, but I have been headbutt by a toddler. Okay. Can I tell you, I had an instant headache. I told y'all last week that I'm not really a person that gets headaches for the most part, right? COVID gave me a headache, a long, a day long headache. That was like, oh, what is this? But when you have that kind of an impact on your head, and like I said, the only time I've ever been headbutted was by my own child. You know, kids think it's funny. She was just a little toddler. She just, bloop. and, uh, you know, I'm sure it wasn't anywhere near being headbutted by, headbutted by an adult. Like it's a baby for God's sake that's doing it. But that hurt. And I was like, hey, you don't do that. You don't headbutt, head, headbutt mummy. That's not nice. Now her head must be hard as a coconut child because she didn't seem like she was phased by it. But it gave me as the receiver of the headbutt an instant headache. Like literally I had a headache in the frontal area of my head. So I can only imagine being headbutted by some crazed woman who's scratching you up, beating you up broken up your glasses, tearing off your shirt. So because he was trying to restrain her and she no longer had the use of her arms, she's using her feet, she's kicking, she's it, and she headbutts him. Wow. Jeez, um, peace. Anyway, he said it was repeated and sustained. They had multiple scratches, scrapes, and headbutts. The son eventually came down trying to help his dad. He was bitten on the chest. I mean... Some of the details of this assault, maybe it's because I'm just not really a fighter after all, you know, not a physical fighter anyway. I fight for people's rights, but, you know, I've never had a fight in my adult life. Even as a kid, I wasn't going on fighting. Now I would defend myself. So if you start any foolishness with me, I am going to defend myself. But kind of think of 
prove it. I've only had to do that once. Only one stup- one guy was stupid enough in high school, Mike, um, to do it, to try trying to get in a physical altercation with me. Um, so I guess I don't know. I don't even know what this fighting is about. I I was like, what? Headbutting, kicking, scratching, tearing off the man's shirt. They have a photo of him where you see the shirt. I mean, we don't, they don't, they don't hand us the photos, but I got a little glimpse from where I was sitting of like the shirt looks like it was like torn on the side, almost like he was in, you know, back in Greece, how they wore those little togas or whatever. Uh, it kind of looked like he had one of those on because his shirt was half torn off the man's body. So one sleeve uh, was completely off, all kind of scratch marks and stuff. The sun comes down. He gets bitten. Is that normal? When you're fighting, do you bite people? Do you headbutt people? I just thought the whole thing was just so weird. So he got bitten on the chest. He got headbutted. He got scratched. And he got kicked in the groin. Oh, my God. Well, I got to tell you, Sharon says hats off to that gentleman because if it was my daddy, um, he would have knocked the hell out of her. And I'm telling you, they really say Dappy knew who to frighten. And I guess she must know which victims to pick because, honey, child, I cannot imagine having to sustain that level of aggression on your front door steps, on your front porch, and not respond in kind. You're just trying to hold her till the police get there. She is a real lucky young lady. You hear me? Because I know enough Caymanians would have turned into her and beat her until the police came with with legal rights too, because then it's self-defense. Anyway, that's not what this guy did. I don't think they I don't think they put one single lick on her. They were just trying to hold her. Oh my God. Strong Will says, Good morning, Sandy. Hope all is well. You need to use Andre's words. Mighty God. Yes, Andre Papacito. Pa- Papacito. <laughs> Papacito. Papacito uh, Stevens. Yes, child. This would be an appropriate time to say, Mighty God. My God. What a bang a ring. Yes. Oh my God. Moya says they should release the police recording. They should release that 911 call. Because like I said, this was a moment of, oh, I wonder if they would let us have the 911 call. I mean, they did release the video of McKeever Bush assault. So why not this one? We want to hear it too. Anyway, honey chow, um, there's more video evidence to come that we haven't seen yet in this trial, by the way. So um, he goes on to say that at some point her mother arrived and the mother... I saw her for the first time yesterday. I've never seen this woman in my life. Seems like she is the calmest person in the world. She is just so laid back and so calm. And I mean, you have to wonder if your mama so calm, where you get this Kung Fu fighting bear of a girl from? Where does this come from in the family? Maybe it's the dad. It's not in the family. Like my father used to say, you're not getting them bad habits from me. They come from your, your mother's side of the family. <laughs> so I don't know, but she not got that kind, but she not got that calmness in her honey child. So anyway, um, the mother shows up, and this is when the witness started to cry a little bit. I felt sorry for him because, you know, as a parent, I think we can all sympathize at some level with a mother coming into a situation where you're trying to get control, right? Now, keep in mind, Tiffany has assaulted her own mother. Now, I can tell you one thing. I have said to you guys over and over again, I don't believe in physical violence. I don't believe in corporal punishment for children. I think if you raise your children right, 99.9% of the time, you would never need to lay hands on them. But this would have been that 0.1%. If my child roll up on me, tell me she going to assault me. I'm sorry. But that is the one day. Y'all listen very carefully now. Because if you ever hear me going to jail for busting up a, a, a young adult, that would have been the one day that it would have happened. <laughs> you would have heard the headlines. Sandra Teresa Hill busted up her own daughter. Yes, because you don't lay hands on me. This is 
is the one time now when them old people used to say, I brought you into this world and I will surely take you out, that I can understand why you'd feel a particular way. What kind of lack of respect where you could put your hands on the woman who brought you into this world and at the end of the day, look at who is there. Look at who is there to support you through thick and thin. Nobody else, not a single committee member coming to sit down and hear your case. Not your sisters, not your cousins, not your daddy, nobody else, just your mother. Respect this woman with everything you have, not just when it's convenient for you. Hmm? Anyway, the testimony given is that the mother showed up, started talking to her very, very calmly. I said to myself, this poor woman has already experienced this so many times that she knows yelling and screaming, it don't even make no sense. Don't even get started. Just calmly spoke to her. And the young lady was um, saying, mommy, why do they always do this to me? And she started, and, and then the witness, the gentleman started crying on the stand. Uh, why do they always do this to me? Here's a young lady who's obviously incapable of taking any responsibility for her actions whatsoever. It's always somebody else's fault why I'm beating them up. Why? This is the question that she had for her mother on the night of this incident. Why do they always do this to me? The witness started to cry and the judge said, oh, do you need a moment? And they handed him some tissue. I think what made him cry is that as a parent, right? Um, if we haven't been through it yet, we all understand that, you know, we love our children unconditionally. And ultimately that bond between a parent and a child should never be broken. It's a very difficult bond to break if it's a strong bond to begin with. And, you know, I'm sure he was sympathizing with the mother in that moment, having a daughter who is broken. Now, I don't know what her um, clinical breaking is. You know what I'm saying? But she clearly has some issues. And we're going to talk about some of um, what was being said yesterday in terms of what is it that is actually wrong with her. Lord Jesus. Mm -mm -mm. Take the wheel. Anyway, um, what a mess. I tell you. So anyway, he got teary eyed on the stand, and it was a it was a it was a somber moment for sure. Then he said that at some point, one police officer arrived first, and then other police officers that came put her under arrest. Um, you know, he could hear her in the police car shouting. So apparently when they put her in the police car, she was still raging, kicking in the police car, trying to kick the grill, the window. They, they weren't even, the officers weren't even sure. They were just like, we were telling her to stop trying to kick out the police car, <laughs> you know, cause then you're going to get other charges laid on you as well. Damaging police property is a serious offense. All right. Um, she was then taken to, um, oh, the, the incident that happened two weeks before, this is interesting, when she took the phone, apparently she went to the mental health unit after that incident. So it is, it is interesting to see that this was actually a buildup of a situation. So two weeks before there was an incident at the house that went down, the victims, the same son and father did nothing about it. Um, you know, there was some mention of her going, checking herself in or whatever to this mental health unit. And two weeks later, then she shows up and all hell really breaks loose at that particular point. I say that because a lot of times there are warning signs, folks, that trouble is coming. And we as victims, potential victims, family members of victims do not see the warning signs. And this is important because I'm sure in retrospect now that father was like, you know what? After that happened, the two weeks, I should have gone and got myself a ring camera, installed it at the front door. I should have gotten security cameras installed around my house. But who thinks that Kung Fu Baby Panda, a.k.a. Miss K-Man Universe, is going to come back and beat you and your son up in such a vicious way? Folks. Secure your homes, invest in at the very minimum, 
That ring doorbell camera would have been the only evidence you would have needed in court, honey child. So that when her defense attorney, Mr. Oliver, um, what's his name, Grimwood, stands up and starts asking you questions about, this is what he said, um, how she he was telling her that you will never gain access to this house again. The witness was like, no, I didn't say that. As though that's an excuse. Like I, I was trying to, I was trying to follow the line of questioning. Even if he had said it, what's the problem? It is his house and he can dictate who comes into his house and who doesn't. But yeah, um, this was the first question. Well, you said to her, you'll never have access to this house again, didn't you? And he was like, that's not really how I speak. And honest to God, like I said, I, I don't know um, the victim like super personally, but it doesn't even sound like something that he would say. So he was like, no, I didn't. That's not how I speak. That's not something I said. Um, but, you know, he said, as a matter of fact, he'd never communicated to her that she was not welcome to the house. She had, he had spoken to his son about that. He had said to her, the son, she's not welcome to this house. He never had a conversation with her about it. So now the narrative is, oh, you were telling her, you know, in an aggressive way that you can never have access to this house again. And all of this was allowing her behavior to, to escalate, right? Um. Then the defense goes on to say, you put hands on her, step forward. So lo look at how they flipped the narrative now, right? So that was what I told you earlier was what the, um, the alleged victim has said in this case. Now the defense comes and says, you're the ones who put your hand, you put her hands, you know, there she is in the door. You open the door. Yes. Up to that point, we agree. Then the story starts to change. You put your hands on her. You step forward to her, right? Um, and then they claim that she fell down, landed on the floor in the door, like on the porch floor. And then this assault, like you guys basically assaulted her, right? And her response was to then do all this other stuff to you. The father said, absolutely false. Those were his, that's a quote, absolutely false. He said, this is a complete fabrication. That's not how it happened. And the way that they put questions to you, you guys should always know this because if you ever are a witness or a victim in a situation, some of these lawyers, they're asking you a question, but you don't even know if it's a question. Because the way that they word it is they word it like a statement. And you're like, is that a question? <laughs> so then it is up to you to then indicate whether or not, um, Paul says no audio, Paul should be audio, um, whether or not you agree with that statement. And so a lot of witnesses get confused. Like if you've never been on the stand before, you're like, what? No, that's not how it happened. So the judge took a moment, a moment and said, listen, he's gonna put certain things to you. If you don't agree with those things, then you say, no, that's not how it happened. No, I don't agree with that. You know, he's making these statements but you don't have to accept that the statement is true. So it can be a little bit confusing. So she's claiming a little bit of self-defense then. And um, they claim that the, that the victim walked over and held her down, saying to her that the police were going to be called. Now, keep in mind that this is a young lady. I don't know where in West Bay she lives and how far it is from this house. But she actually took the time to cycle on a bicycle, right? Didn't have a car. She probably still can't drive because remember she'd, she'd lost her license for a whole other court case, a whole other shen shenanigan, right? So she probably can no longer drive. She got on her bicycle, which by the way, how does Miss Cayman give her a car? How does the ministry give her a car if she doesn't have a valid license? How does that work? Are they going to give her a chaperone as well? Hmm, I wonder. Anyway, I digress. So, yes, so she gets on her bicycle. And, you know, I have to wonder, what was she thinking the entire time that she's cycling over to this man's house on her bicycle? Pedal, pedal, pedal. I'm going to beat him up. Pedal, pedal, pedal. He better open the front door. Like, that would have given you, say it was a five, ten minute drive. Like I said, I don't know where she lives. And the two of these met because she was selling some car or buying some car from him or some, some story it was. And that's how they met because of an EK trade ad. Y'all be careful of these ads now, honey, Jim. Um, so she cycles over there before all this pops off, having a little bit of ample time to think about 
what exactly it is that she was going to do. Anyway. Uh, then the, the, the defense attorney says, well, I'm looking at this photo of your glasses and they don't really look that bad. Uh, you know, just the top bar is bent a little bit. So, um, you know, I'm also referring to your initial statement to the police. It doesn't say it in such detail. She was like looking you in the eye and twisted up your glasses and threw them on the ground. Are you now saying it in this manner for special effects because you're trying to make an impact in court? The gentleman was like, no, I'm saying it like how it happened. You know, a written statement was very, very condensed. Um, and now I'm giving the details of what transpired that night and the details of what was in my written statement. So the, the lawyer was trying his best. I mean, I wasn't convinced. This is a judge alone trial. But, you know, I wasn't um, convinced at all by the defense attorney. So we'll see in the end whether the judge is or not. So he's like, oh, you're trying to just play this up to make it look worse. And he said, my glasses were completely destroyed and had to be repaired. You've got the invoice for that. Oh, no, no, no. I'm not disputing that we that you had to replace them. But it wasn't really, the damage wasn't really that bad, was it? Mm, mm, mm. Listen to me. There's a reason why these lawyers get paid what they get paid, you know, because they are good, honey child. They'd be having you question yourself like, did this really happen? Well, look at the photo. The photo doesn't look that bad. And he's like, well, the photo might not capture that the glasses were completely destroyed. But trust me, that's exactly what, you know. Anyway, obviously they couldn't be repaired. So then that was the first witness. Witness number two was the first police officer. He was the first one to arrive at the scene. So he said, you know, he he joined in by Zoom because I think he's off island or something. But he said he observed um, two males and two females. There was an adult female who was standing next to them. The younger female was agitated. She was yelling. Um, he put her in handcuffs. She said to him, well, what about them? As she was being put in handcuffs. And then he heard, after he put her in the car, he heard this banging sound coming from the police car because she was kicking something inside of the rear seat of the vehicle. He was all right. I mean, he established, you know, he was the first on the scene, what his initial observations were. Um, the defense at this point now starts asking him questions about, have you had any training on how to deal with mental health um, patients or to recognize when someone's having an episode and this and that? He was like, you know, as part of our initial training at the, at the RCIPS, yes, that's in it, but I haven't had any specialty training. I'm not a mental health police officer expert or whatever that would entail or whatever, right? So he said, um, no, I mean, that's not his area of expertise and he hasn't had any additional training. It's kind of interesting, the point that they were trying to make, which uh, at one point the judge kind of told him to move on, the defense attorney, because she felt like the, the answer, the question was asked and answered and he was kind of belaboring the point. She was like, just move on. Obviously, there's no in-depth training of RCIPS officers on how to deal with mental health patients or to even identify that someone is a mental health patient. Now, one of the most interesting things is he did ask him, the older woman who was at the scene, which was her mother, did she at any point say to you um, who or that Tiffany was a mental health case? And he said, no, her own mother didn't say anything about her mental health, which I think is something that's actually going to hurt the defense. Think about it. You try to make this whole case about how she has such severe mental health issues, which obviously her mother knows that she's been on the mental health ward on more than one occasion. She allegedly has tried to commit suicide by jumping in front of a car before and other such things, right? Other such crazy behavior. And the mother doesn't say that to the police when they arrive on the scene. Tiffany was refusing to apparently identify who she was even. The police were asking for credentials, name and whatever, and she refused to give it to them. So the mother had to say, She's my daughter, Tiffany Connolly, Tiffany Ann Connolly, whatever the heck her name is, right? So the mother had to provide that information. You would have thought that this is, and, and now he's putting the police under pressure. Why didn't you know she was a mental patient? Uh, if she was really a mental patient and had such severe mental illness, why wouldn't her own mother mention it? The mother's there, calm, cool, and collected. This is not the first time that she's seen Tiffany go off the rails. Um, she's been assaulted by Tiffany. She's is pretty well versed in how this is probably going to go down. She should say, you know, my daughter has a history of mental health issues. Send her to the mental health ward. 
call her doctor. Here's the name of her physician. Maybe she needs a, a mental health facility, you know, shot in the bunkie or whatever, get her to the proper medical care. So I found it bizarre that he was pressuring the police about this question. Her mother, of course, will not take the stand. So no one's going to be asking her that. But if it was such a critical thing to her care and understanding what was happening, why didn't the mother mention it? It is a little bit bizarre. And I think when he, I don't know if they always tell lawyers, don't ask a question that you don't know the answer to. Because then you look stupid. And, you know, at some point you might get an answer that's going to, you know, so I felt like this is one of those questions that maybe the lawyer didn't know the answer to. Well, did the mother tell you? And it's like, nope. Oh, she didn't? No. The mother didn't mention anything about her mental health. Okay. So he quickly moved on from that. The second police officer that took the stand was a female officer. Um, she said that she was using her body to like her head and other things in the car, slamming up against the car when they had put her in the police car. She was cursing profusely was the term that was used. So she kept telling them, F all of you, like over and over and over again. At some point, she would calm down a little bit. So even when they got to the detention center, they did take the handcuffs off of her. She calmed down a little bit, and then she would get agitated again. Now, yesterday, the prosecution, this was the last prosecution witness, then they started playing um, video footage from inside the detention center, but they had to stop it because time was running out, right? And so when they go back now in December, they've set aside two more days for the remainder, remainder of the hearing. And um, we haven't really seen a whole lot yet in the footage, but I'm assuming this footage is going to show this police officer getting assaulted and Tiffany's behavior at the detention center. But what we have seen, just a little snippet, is where one of the other officers behind the desk, I guess he's an intake officer, whatever, was asking her to put on her mask. So remember, we were still in a time last year, still COVID, you had to wear your mask in certain places, mandatory, blah, blah, blah. And she basically told him in a very flippant way, what are you worried about my mask for? Put on your own mask properly and you wouldn't have to worry about me. Just like, like, so having not seen the rest of the, the video, I'm just like, ooh, this shows an element of her personality. You understand now how we're going to get into the details and we're going to see unrefuted evidence, video evidence. Don't lie about your stinking attitudes and you're assaulting people, whatever. This isn't left up to, well, the victim said this, but his glasses weren't really that mashed up. Uh, you know, maybe it wasn't that bad. When you have video evidence, child, the evidence will speak volumes. Y'all run out and get y'all a ring doorbell, have cameras in your home so that when people go off, you have the evidence to say, here you go, police. This is actually what happened. Independent, verifiable evidence. Get your dash cams. When you have those accidents happen, the other person like, no, you're at fault. Oh, really? Pull out the dash cam footage. Mm -hmm. So this video, I'm looking forward to the next hearing in December because this is going to get uber interesting. But already, the attitude's there. You can't tell me you need to put on a mask in here. Actually, at the time, it was the law. But you see that attitude? That attitude of non-compliance. I'm like, why are the Ms. Cayman committee members not here listening to this? Because they don't want to know the truth. They want to live in their little fantasy, make-believe world of pageantry. If they wanted to know the truth, they would have been there yesterday and heard the witnesses for themselves. It's open court. Anybody can come. Um, I wasn't entirely impressed with this second police officer. 95% of the questions that she answered, she just said, I do not recall that. I do not recall that. I do not recall that. It occurred to me, RCAPS, if you're listening, you need to give your police officers some training on how to go to court and how to answer questions. At one point, even the judge was a little bit confused. She says, she asked the question, when you say you do not recall that, does it mean that it didn't go so? Because again, he's putting statements to you or you just don't remember. And she was saying, well, you know, she, does, she just doesn't remember. 
Now, here's the thing. After you're involved in an incident like this as a police officer, surely the first thing you do is write up in your log this an incident report and what transpired. Before going to court, you would have had the benefit of reviewing your incident report, reviewing your statement that you provided the prosecution, the DPP's office, in order for this to get where it got. So I was thinking to myself, did she not review any of those things? Or were those things not really that detailed? And this is where, in my mind, the RCIPS needs to step up to the plate and offer and prepare, and I've seen it on more than one occasion, so it's not necessarily anything new, but they need to prepare their officers on if an incident happens, this could potentially go to court. So you sit down at the earliest possible time, write out your incident report with as much detail as you can remember. Then you're going to give your police statement when it, it's going to the files, going to the DPP's office. Again, being as detailed as possible. Were the rings on her right hand or her left hand? Because there was something about her wearing jewelry. And they'd ask her to remove her jewelry and she was refusing to remove it. Mm, mm, mm. And so then they had to assist her with taking the jewelry off because she was basically told them, you come take it off. You see that attitude? Oh, you're bad. You come take it off of me. Mm, mm, mm. I, I hope to God all of that is on video because I sure am looking forward to that section. But this person on the stand was like, oh, I, I can't remember. I was just like, you know, I know things happen very, very fast, but you can't remember nothing? No, 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 no. She said that Tiffany's mom ID'd her because she refused to do so. Again, the mother made no mention of her mental health issues. Um, and the one thing that stood out in her mind is the fact that she kept saying F all of you <laughs> throughout the entire thing. That's what stood out in, in the officer's mind. So at one point she said that um, she struck her in the face and she went to strike her a second time, but was prevented from doing so. So then it was like, oh, well, did she strike you with her left hand or right hand? The officer was like, <laughs> all I know is I got struck. I don't know which hand she used. I got struck. So that's another charge that she has is actually um, disorderly conduct and assaulting a police officer. Hmm. Well, honey, chill. What a hot mess. Put your mask on and you don't have to worry about me. That's what she said to the officer at the detention center when he was asking her to please comply with the mask requirement. She said, you put your mask on and you don't have to worry about me. You put it on properly and you don't have to worry about me. Woo, let me read some of your comments. Marshall says, Tiffany mother is, is calm because she knows what kind of animal she's dealing with. So sad. Yeah, maybe she was afraid too. Like if she didn't walk in there being calm, cool and collected, she might've gotten beaten up again. Karen says, and this person is representing her country. Yes, she wears a crown, honey chow. Uh, Moveen says some of these children nowadays are so disrespectful to their parents. But you know what, Moveen? Correct me if I'm wrong. But there's no way, absolutely no way, that you could be disrespectful to your parent like this overnight. This is something that has developed for years. The signs would have been there. Like Miss Miss Brenda saying, Sandra, they're enablers, and that, and then it's tough love. These children are not shown any tough love. You know why you don't y'all don't know anything publicly about the mother being assaulted? Because when she did, when she assaulted the mother and the sister, they refused to press charges. So the girl keeps getting the message over and over again that you can do this to people and there will be no consequences for your behavior. Anyway, Ms. Brenda said that one comment is the core of her mental state. Everyone should pay close attention. Which comment was that? But you know what is so interesting is from the last incidents that the girl, that this young lady had, the court said you need to be getting counseling and whatever care that, um, it's not DCFS, but probation office says that you should get. And I cannot help but wonder, that was part of the conditions of her no um, rec nothing recorded is that she'd be getting mental care health. Who was ensuring that that was actually happening? Who was it? Tiffany's an adult. 
Was she actually going to therapy sessions? If she's on medication, was she taking her medication? A lot of questions have really arisen out of this. So first day hearing yesterday, with some record, a lot of these things are what's called part heard. So now the parties have to, they don't set aside. I don't know why they initially only set aside one day because you know that this is going to be more than one day, right? Anyway, um, now it goes into December. I think it's the 5th and the 6th will be the next block of time that all the parties have two days. Uh, the prosecution will continue with their case. They're going to show the video. They're going to show her interview. And so we'll break it down during the next hearing. And by the way, her interview, according to the statements that I've read, she admitted most of the assault. Certain parts of it she claimed that she couldn't remember. <laughs> so now that your, your story has changed for the purposes of a defense, it'll be interesting to hear exactly what she admitted to during her police interview. Because the police then called her mental, her psychiatrist or psychologist, I don't know what his professional title is, um, from the mental health unit and spoke to him. And he said that she is, he did an assessment, I guess, and said that she is perfectly fine to be interviewed and processed by the police. That's interesting when you want to talk about her mental health because she got the sign off from her physician to be interviewed. So what kind of mental health break exactly was she having that a professional okayed her to be processed and be interviewed? Hmm. The devil's in the details, y'all. Good morning, Miss Joy. Anyway, when they when they play the, the statements and her interview and everything, back in, in December, we'll bring that. Here's the quandary that we're at now. It's obvious that this trial could go into, in terms of getting a decision and being sentenced, this could go into next year. The international pageant, folks, is January the 14th. So the 5th and the 6th, she's back in court. I don't know if the judge will then take time to deliver, 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 deliberate, <laughs> sorry, and then deliver a verdict separate and apart from that, or if she will do so at the conclusion of the trial, because sometimes they then take even more time to think about it and to write their judgment. So that could be another week or two. Then you're looking at the Christmas holidays. So you're probably at the very minimum looking at early January before you hear a guilty plea. Weeks away, potentially, before this young lady is supposed to go to the Miss Universe pageant. But you see the quandary that they're in and the situation that this committee has created? This is of their own making. And their position is they will now not do anything, they're taking the McKeever approach, child, until the outcome of the trial. Now, in my mind, I'm like, does that mean the outcome of a guilty or not guilty verdict versus sentencing? Because the, the judge can deliver her, her guilty or not guilty verdict, and then it will take another month before sentencing because now we need character references. We need um, a social inquiry report, which is, you know, given reasons like, oh, yeah, why the court should have mercy on her. Oh, she had such a tough childhood, blah, blah, blah. She grew up with an absentee father. She has daddy issues that's making her crazy in these relationships. Yaddy, yaddy, yaddy. That's like another month because they're so busy. Now, they could expedite all of this if they really cared to, but I'm telling you, the court doesn't do it. So from now, her team could say, you know what, let's go ahead and request a social inquiry report, but they're not going to do that until the guilty verdict comes in. The system is at times slow and laborious and just antiquated. But that's how, that's the order in which things will now go. So she could still end up going away, folks. Listen to me carefully. Representing the Cayman Islands on the international scene, which is the highlight of her um, reign, essentially, at the Miss Universe pageant, get to travel an hour dime, represent us, and the case won't be finalized until she come back. Or it could be at some level a guilty verdict come in a week or two before she leaves. And then who's going to be prepared 
to go to Miss Universe. The runner up who all this time may not even want this crown now. What a mess. Uh, Vicky says nothing is wrong with her. Just spoilt and bad got to her, got to have her way. If she cannot have her way, then she brings out this nasty bad temper and her head is full of herself. Things have to go her way. Well, I tell you what, Vicky, um, Jonathan says, I believe that too. Ms. Moveen says, that's my belief also. Ms. Joy says, yes, agree, Sandra. Um, what I would say is, you know, she showed up yesterday, um, fit the part of a beauty queen, dressed the part, you know, the weave looking good, the hair looking good, you know, bright, colorful outfits, um, as though someone who has not done anything wrong ever in their life. She even had a pink handbag that had handwritten on it at the top. It said designer logo here or designer logo or something. And then further down, it says, insert cash here. What an interesting bag, choice of bags to go to court when you're being accused of some very serious offenses. Assaulting a police officer is no joke. Whilst in custody at the detention center, for you to think that you can strike a police officer, and like I said, this is not the first time that she's assaulted a police officer, and other instances where she was arrested before she kicked multiple officers in the groin. But you see, when you don't hold your children accountable, they don't learn the lessons. The court allowed two cases, nothing, no conviction recorded. Let's see what happens this time. We're all waiting to see because if you continue to allow this young lady to get away with this kind of behavior, nothing recorded, nothing recorded. Oh, in the name of mental health, folks, you can have mental health issues and you commit a crime and you still have to pay the piper. Huh? Charles Manson, he got mental health issues. Bat shit crazy if you ask me, but guess what? He's spending the rest of his life in jail. Having mental health issues is not an excuse or a defense for you to go out there and commit crimes. Now, there might be other things that are available to you while you're in jail, such as therapy and medication, whatever, if you have mental health issues. Remember the mother who killed her own daughter? The little, what was she, like six or seven years old, maybe eight? Stabbed her to death? They say she got mental health issues too, but guess what? She has gotten a substantial sentence. It might be a life sentence or 30 something years, whatever. She will spend a good deal of her life in jail. And yes, while you're here, since you have mental health issues, you take your medication. But you're still in jail. So the, 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 the defense line of, oh, she has mental health issues as somehow something that's going to get her off. I pray to God that the lawyer has adequately explained to her that mental health issues is not a defense to this kind of or any kind of behavior. You can still go to jail. You can still be found guilty, even if you have mental health issues. Because you see now, here's the scoop. If this lawyer has not properly explained this to her, the next thing you hear when she kung fu kicked the lawyer in his head, then it's going to be another story. Make sure you tell the girl the truth. And the worst possible outcome. That's all I can tell you, honey child. Good morning, caller. Welcome to the program. Good morning, Sandra. Sandra. Yes, ma'am. Um, I'm wondering, though, okay, this uh, Tiffany is, and her family is a church going family. Where do we bring the church? into this because I know that um, they, you know, they go to church. Someone say she had an episode out there. Oh. Um, um, everything was, no, this is just gossip. Yeah. So not that I know, mm -hmm. not that I know. I just, I've just heard it. Mm -hmm. Now, if she was going on like this, for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. Why didn't the parent, which Anita seemed to be sorry, 
seem to be a very good parent. Mm-hmm. But then it was lacking that this girl was screaming out for help. Mm. She knew that she had a problem and she was screaming out for help. But what did they do? Put her in a beauty contest. Now it comes down to the the committee. Mm. Are they not ashamed of her of themselves to hear all of this stuff? And even if they didn't, if they heard it af- afterwards, any committee any, all over the world would have says, no, 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 no. We cannot send her anyway. Mm. In fact, instead, it take the 70,000 and get her some professional help. It's not that she is a spout person or, 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 or anything like that. What has happened to her can happen any of us or any any um, person that have a young per, a young girl, young boy, anything can happen. So why do we admit? In fact, if she got all these charges, would she be able to travel? I don't think so. Then supposing if she is and get there and have an episode there. Mm-hmm. What does Cayman do? What does Cayman do not then? What does the committee do then? Are they going to turn their backs like we turn our backs on Makiva, which did things three or four times or even more? Maybe some that we don't know about. But let's get some help for that child. Mm-hmm. It's not right for her to carry on like this, and we call it tantrums. My God, one or two children in her family had tantrum. What happened? We talked to them. We spanked their little behind. Mm. And this is how it go. But that was back then. Why are we avoiding the fact that this girl has a serious problem? Mm-hmm. You don't throw tant- call it a tantrum out on somebody else. You throw that tantrum whom, or that's how I, I've known that tantrums go. When he or she can have their way um, with whatever they wanted, and, and the parents say you can't have it. We're avoiding the fact that we could help a young person that needs help immediately, immediately. And I tell you, if the doctor or psychiatrist say it's not something wrong here, knowing or hearing all of these these things that was done and Mm. she doing it, my God, (laughs) I would say he don't need, he he need to have his license revoked. Mm Mm-hmm. Because that person not right there. We hearing this and what we do about it, we form excuses. That is my opinion that uh, that girl is crying out for help. Let's give her some help and whoever is in, next mm-hmm. in line or the first runner up, send that person off or Otherwise, we're going to get some more sheen up and disgrace on this island again. My opinion and only my opinion. Mm -hmm. Not accusing other people of this and this and this and this and this. But I would say about the doctor, the committee, Mm -hmm. they need to go. They should be ashamed of themselves. No, I'm accusing. Yes. Thank you, Miss Sandra. Yes, thank you, you, my dear. Always bring the truth to us. Yes, my dear. Thank you again, and God bless you. Thank you so much. Well, you know, the verdict is still out. Obviously, she remains innocent until proven guilty. So she's not been proven guilty yet. The trial has begun. Miss Brenda says the prosecutors should have done a better job preparing their witnesses, shaking my head. Um... Normally what they do is they ask them to, you know, review 
their police statement. If if it's a, a person that has never given testimony in the stand before, they do kind of walk them through like what to expect, not so much with the police, but with the victim. So I'm sure that the victim in this case would have had a little bit of like, okay, this is the order of, you know, what to expect. But, you know, they can't tell you how to answer questions. They can only tell you, you know, to tell the truth. But I do think that the police need to have a little bit more of a, a preparation for court bundle and training session for their officers. And I'm going to reach out to the RCIPS and see if they do such a thing. Because even as someone you guys know, you know, I have a law degree. I've, I've been around the judiciary way before even coming back to the Cayman Islands. Um, as a high school student, I was involved in teen court. You know, I know a little bit about the process. And there are uh, like victim advocates who will work with victims, that's not, the police are not necessarily, but although the police officer was a victim because she was also assaulted, you know? Um, but, you know, these people will work with victims to, to prepare them. Giving testimony, uh, you've never been on the stand before, it can be a very, very stressful situation, folks. And even as we saw this father yesterday, he just, sometimes spontaneously, you break out in tears. You're not expecting the stresses of this thing that's gone on for months and months and months that has been all over the news and highlighted. You know, we haven't told you who the victim is, but there's still, this is a small community and there are people who do know, you know, who this family is and they are being um, impacted by this. So Karen says maybe her family is actually afraid of her. I think that's fair to say, again, given the history of um, what has been covered. Oh, the other thing that I should... Um, not forget to mention, I did forget this actually, is after she assaulted um, the father and the son, she then went outside, took her bicycle. I told you guys she rode her bicycle there, picked up her bicycle. You guys know, you ever rode a bicycle before? You know what it takes to pick up a bicycle like over your head? She picked up the bicycle, threw it at one of the family vehicles smashed up the, the bonnet and the, the glass and whatever, smashed up the vehicle, and then took a brick that was somewhere close by and threw the brick on the other vehicle, smashing up the windshield of that vehicle. So it wasn't just assault on the persons. She actually has two property damage charges for messing up the two family vehicles as well. And something ricocheted and hit the neighbor's car, but Charlie, he couldn't be bothered. He's like, I, I'm not going to press any charges. He just fixed that out of pocket. Has she paid um, to fix the vehicles? Let me ask. Because I mean, wh whatever you know, the verdict is, there could be some action that she could have been taken, conciliatory in advance to say, you know, I'm sorry at some level. And I'm curious whether or not I'm gonna ask this question. The person said, no, she's not fixed the vehicles. This is a girl, mental health issues or not, she, has no concept of consequences. No one has ever held this young lady responsible. I would have reached out and said, okay, I'm getting money now from Miss Cayman, from the Cayman Islands government. That's the people of the Cayman Islands, like the country. Can I pay you a little $500 a month to pay for the damage to your vehicles? She's done none of that. No accountability. I'm so saddened by this whole thing. Anyway, Someone said it is easier to build strong children than to repair broken men. You better believe that, honey chill. So this person says, um, good morning, Sandra. I go to the same church as she and her family barely come to church. Her mom come more than the kids and they all go to John Gray Church. So, um, and again, going to church don't make you no more a Christian than not going to church. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Um, so, you know, yeah, they go to church. The churches don't care. The churches don't care about a lot of this stuff. They're just there to collect the tithes and have a nice little ceremony for you to do some singing and whatever, and then go away having your cup filled with glory and whatever. Um, listen, she is an adult. So at some point we have to stop expecting everybody else around her. If they would stop enabling her, that'd be great. But they also need to stop. Um, like she just needs to take some responsibility. You know, you have anxiety problems or, you know, you have issues with aggression, whatever. 
get help. Good morning, caller. Good morning, Sandra. Hi. How are you? Not bad, dear. How are you? Okay. Um, just wanted to say, as I'm listening to your program this morning regarding the um, beginning of this trial, and just wanted to touch on one or two things, if you don't mind, because uh -huh. I heard you say um, about you know mental health being, I guess, the defense in this matter. And if she has a history of mental health, according to the Cayman Islands law, if that has been diagnosed, you then become a ward of the state. That's the first thing. If you do commit offenses as a mental health patient, they tend not to put it on your record mm -hmm. because you have that automatic defense. And that may be the reason why she does not have an existing criminal record well it's not an auto, it's not an automatic defense i mean no but... no i didn't no no I, I didn't say it is i'm saying perhaps uh -huh. that's the way it's being used uh, uh -huh. and in this present matter here now if she is exonerated because of mental issues then the only alternative to that should be that she's then committed to a mental institution whether they want to put it on her record or not. And then perhaps her doctor, her treating mental physician, needs to have a meeting with her family and explain to them what is going on with her and perhaps help them in how to handle it. I know that a lot of families are in deep denial when the word mental issue is mentioned. They don't want to accept that that is the case, most uh -huh. like drug addicts, you know, and but it it all it all starts with education, and I'm not suggesting in any way that that should be used as an excuse for what she did to these people. Uh -huh. I'm saying that could prevent it, perhaps in the future, if she gets properly medicated, and counseling and support from her family, and they are educated to recognize when perhaps she hasn't taken her medication or when something is just not going right. Mm. But she, if she continues to be exonerated with nothing else, you know, attached to it, this will continue to happen. And unfortunately, it will escalate. And I am probably not even going to mention my comments regarding her and the Miss Universe pageant. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing I would like to say, because I heard it mentioned, is that they are taking the Nikiva approach. Now, I beg to differ there, uh -huh. because they, they, they did not, and they are not, taking the Nikiva approach. Because everybody jumped on Nikiva Bush, even before the investigation was started, to the point that he has now stepped down. But no, let, let me let me clarify. Here. Perhaps I need to clarify what I what I actually meant by that when I said the McKeever. No, approach. that's okay. That's okay. Yeah. Um, and it wasn't in relation and, to this but, last but, incident, but, but the one before. But with this girl, mm -hmm. but with this girl, she had already been charged with a date to appear in court. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The committee became aware of it at some stage, mm -hmm. and it, certainly it was before the local pageant. And they all had an opportunity to have a meeting and discuss this and come to the right decision about it. And that was not done. Mm -hmm. I have spoken out about this before. It has offended quite a few people. They don't speak to me anymore. But you know what? Huh? That's okay. Because I live by principles and standards. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what is good for the goose is good for the gander. And I will say again that other girls have been disqualified uh -huh. for less than what this girl has done. Absolutely. You received an email concerning another contestant uh -huh. for liking or reposting someone's yes. post on Instagram, uh -huh. which disappears in 24 hours. Uh -huh. She didn't create the post. It was not her post. Uh -huh. I think we all do this from time to time. We share things. And sometimes we even share things. That Facebook comes back to say, we took this down because, you know, it's not factual. Right. Fair enough. We, did, we didn't know that. Uh -huh. But to threaten her with being disqualified because she did that. Yes. You see, to me, 
that's a low blow. Uh -huh. When you have this mess and you refuse to even acknowledge that you drop the ball here. Uh -huh. And that's uh -huh. everybody. It's not just her family. It's uh -huh. not just the committee. Everybody dropped the ball. Uh -huh. And you know what? I would be very curious to see if they would publish the letter that they say they got from Miss Universe International accepting her to that pageant based on them now learning of her troubles here in Cayman. With that, I am going to shut up and I will listen to the rest of your show. I appreciate it, my dear. Thank you so much. Okay. All right. Um, so let's read. We're going to go a little bit into overtime. Quite a few comments have come in. So Moveen says, yes, um, if it was an ongoing thing. That's true. Sometimes you have to give children hard um, love. Miss Vicky says, I bet you all she won't get any jail time. Um, she's already on probation. I can't remember when her probation would have expired, to be honest, and the other things, because just because she had no, no conviction recorded, doesn't mean she wasn't on probation, to be clear. But I don't know from those if the probation has expired or whatever. So if she gets a guilty verdict, it could very well trigger um, whatever she, you know, like, I don't, I don't know what, I don't know. I don't know what it would have been, but, you know, she, she could be in a little bit of extra trouble there. But jail time, who knows? It might not be that they send her to jail. But um, it'll be curious to see, number one, if she's found guilty, which I, from what I've seen, do believe that she will be. That's just my personal opinion. And then number two, what the court does, um, because the court is always made aware of previous offenses, even if no conviction was recorded. That then triggers and the court is aware that, OK, this is not your first time at the rodeo. This is actually your third time. And here we go again. Gabby says more like using mental health as an excuse to get away. Um, you know, none of us can, can swear for her mental health. All we can do is say that, um, you know, obviously that's the defense that she's used and she has a history of using that and a history of being um, at the mental health unit. Right. Now you have people who are, Somebody says this is a K-Man Donald Trump case. <laughs> you have people who are um, aggressive and out of control. And do you see that as a mental health or you just see that as someone who has no ability to regulate their own behavior? There are people who are narcissistic, psychotic, um, all these other things. And I don't know, narcissism, I guess, falls in the spectrum of, of supposedly mental health as well. But, you know, these are people who can be very, very manipulative. And I'm not a professional psychiatrist or psychologist, but my observations, what I've seen of the situation, what I know of the young lady, I think her issues are more that than anything else. She knows how to manipulate people. She knows how to manipulate situations and how to take zero accountability for her own actions. And so far, look at where it's gotten her. She's holding the crown of Miss Cayman Universe. She hoodwinked the entire committee. She hoodwinked all of the judges. Well, you talk to her pageant sisters and they were not hoodwinked. That's why none of them ran up to her, hugging her after the, after the event, as they normally would have. A lot of them were not fooled by the duplicity because they know all the stuff that she has done. And not just what we've talked about, but even harassing people on social media, some of the same things that she claims that, oh, she's a victim of and she's standing up against when it comes to bullying and whatever, she has done herself with no remorse. And so a lot of these young girls out there who know the real deal are not impressed with her and they're not fooled by her either. Y'all old people kind of get fooled a little bit easier. And somebody says, oh, I'm feeling suicidal. Nobody wants that on their head. Like, oh, we said something bad about Tiffany. So she went and harmed herself. Nobody would ever want that. But is that real? Or is that someone who is knowing how to play us all? Uh, Janet says there's no way she should be allowed to represent any pageant while this is going on. The other question is, I mean, set aside the assault and all that kind of stuff. Do you want someone who has a severe mental health issues unresolved 
representing your country? Even that alone should be a reason to disqualify someone for their own good, because they may not be able to handle the stresses of competition. What if the child go overseas and have a mental breakdown? The committee will be held responsible as they should be. Ms. Brenda says that, um, I beg to differ, they didn't take the McKeever approach. Let me clarify what I meant by that, because I think it's worth clarifying. With the last assault, not this current case, that's now, I think the DPP's office has the file, not this case. The one before, when I said the McKeever Bush approach, I'm talking about the other MPs who stepped up to the plate and refused to call McKeever Bush out because, oh, we're going to wait to see if he's charged. And then when he was charged, oh, well, we'll wait to see if he's found guilty. Then he's found guilty. Oh, well, we'll wait for the sentencing. And that's how it went. And so nothing was ever done because they were always waiting for the next step in the process. So that's what I meant by that comment uh, with the committee taking the McKeever Bush approach, meaning that they will take the approach of kicking the can further down. Oh, let's see. Let's wait for the trial. Trial happens. They didn't show up. Remember, they claimed that they were on a fact-finding mission because they wanted to know the truth. They don't even show up to hear what the victims have had to say, what her defense is, nothing, because they honestly don't care if truth be known, right? Now they kick it further down. Oh, wait till we get a verdict. Verdict comes back right before the pageant guilty. Then they're going to say, oh, well, um, mm, yeah, we don't know what the court, court is. He going to go to jail? Is she gonna, let's wait. And so nothing will come of it is my point as far as the committee is concerned. And the ministry, again, no ministry representative there yesterday listening to the allegations against her. Why not? Why were you not there hearing what a reigning Miss Cayman universe is being accused of? Ministry representatives should have been there. It's, it's a question that needs to be answered. It's like these people do not care. That's the bottom line. And they're sending a very clear message to the people of the Cayman Islands. Lavana says, I'm trying to figure out what's the reason for having a first runner up and not using her. Well, the reason is they're all scared of Tiffany. And the committee dropped the ball long ago to the point now where they know if they hold her accountable because their, their criteria was so slack to begin with, right? That at the end of the day, if they try to hold her accountable now, she's going to sue them. That's what they're afraid of. Ms. Moya says the committee has shown their incompetence on so many levels. This is why the committee will con community will continue to question if they're even qualified to be able to be on the committee to begin with. Well, it seems like the bar for qualifications is pretty low for most of them. Um, thank you, Ms. Live. Yes, it is January the 14th in New Orleans, the Miss Universe pageant. Ms. Morveen says no one is above the law. Good morning, Karen. Um, Anthony says unbelievable incompetence from the committee. Have to call out the minister as well. A requirement was to be um, of good character. Surely if you're in court, you cannot said to be of good character until you are cleared. Well, Anthony, it's the reverse. You're of good character until you're convicted. We're innocent until proven otherwise. However, the allegations against her, which she admitted in her police interview to some extent, that I think, because this is not a situation where there's evidence that this didn't happen this way at all, and she's being falsely accused. This is a situation where this young lady in her police interview admitted to doing at least some of this. Why is the committee not there to hear that evidence and to see that video for themselves? Because that will be in her own words. Now is she going to contradict herself? Why is a ministry representative not there? Don't take CMR's word for it, right? I'm sure the committee can claim now that, oh, we're twisting it, didn't it? Don't take our word for it. Don't take CNS's word for it. They were in court yesterday. Don't take the compass word for it. In terms of what transpired, you show up for yourself and you hear the evidence. And you have, as they say in law, you see the weight of the evidence for yourself. That's what a right thinking committee would have done. Committee chairperson, chair lady, minister and ministry. That's what y'all should be doing. Why are you ignoring the situation and pretending like it doesn't exist? Maybe they're taking the approach from Mr. Dean. Mr. Dean Shillette says, well, before we accuse someone, um, 
of this, before we accuse someone of the stick in their eyes, we should take the pole out of our own eyes. Uh, Dean, I think it's the opposite here. All of us might have little sticks in our eyes, but she's the one walking around with the big fat pole. Listen to me. I am almost a 50-year-old woman. Let me go ahead and put my age out there for those of you who are curious. And I have never in my entire life, despite the fact being arrested way more times than Tiffany, by the way, for the record, I have never assaulted a police officer. I've never boxed anybody in my life. What stick would you be referring to that's in her eye? What pole are you referring to? Multiple arrests, multiple assaults. I would never think about assaulting my sister, my mother, although sometimes you feel like you want to box them, but still. My mother, exes that you get upset with, kicking in a police car. I mean, I think you have to, in all fairness, look at the details of what is being alleged. This is not someone accusing this young lady unreasonably of anything. Oh my gosh, John says that Charles Manson died in 2017. Oh, did he? Oh shoot, I thought he was still alive. Good. One less psycho around the place. Amoya says the Crown needs to bring their best assaults, to bring these past assaults that were not recorded as a basis for character references. Oh, don't worry. The process is Ms. Moya, if she's found guilty, the court will then ask for any previous convictions. And this will then come up as, okay, she's been before us before for a very similar set of circumstances and no, nothing was recorded, but here are the circumstances. So the court will know Miss Moy about that. Don't you worry about that. Maureen says, I don't think Cayman should allow someone like that to represent the Cayman Islands and in an international platform. I'm a Jamaican uh, to I'm certain because we're all Caribbean people. Oh, mess. Uh, Ms. Brenda says if she's exonerated by reasons of mental illness or mental issues, then she should be committed to mental institution. That's what the law says. Well, like I said, I don't quite get it because it's it's not exactly a, a an insanity defense that they're running. And to be clear, um, in UK law, the insanity defense is not used very often. So I'm not sure if this is exactly what this is. If she is trying to use insanity defense. But what I do know is the questions about her mental illness are being brought up over and over again, uh, especially to the police. Um, but it's it's not something again that will exonerate you from being found guilty or even from going to jail. And I gave you several examples already this morning. So I, I'm not quite sure. I mean, it's a whole area of law insanity and what they call automation and so forth. Like I said, at one point um, there apparently was a twisting of the facts, according to the first witness, where, um, you know, she was claiming that she was the victim and she didn't actually insult anyone. So, I, I mean, I don't know. It's it's a little bit of an interesting defense. We'll see where it goes. Um, Miss Darlene says, and she will quickly run for the spot because she so wanted to win. Poor thing is she had looked so disappointed when she received the first runner up. On the night of Miss Keyman, I was speaking about the first runner up. Who was the first runner up again? The next pageant is next year, August, I assume. The Universal Pageant, International Miss Universe, is in January. So, um, Mr. Dean, Miss Dean, sorry, says, I'm prompt to ask if it is the first pageant for the committee who accepted her in the pageant. No. These committee members have been there for donkey years. Most of them, at least five, maybe even 10 years or more, they've been with the committee for a while. So they're not supposed to be so incredibly naive. Miss Sue, exactly no way she should. 
Miss Darlene says, hopefully somewhere in the world. Um, I just looked it up. It's going to be in New Orleans. Oh, yes. The international pageant is January in New Orleans, Louisiana. Jess says, if Tiffany had been held accountable in the first instance, um, instead of no, re no recorded convictions, maybe this young man and his family would not have been going through all of this. She basically got away with it all. And she thought she could continue. I think that that's entirely true. I could also understand, though, why the judge at the time may have not recorded the conviction. She was a bit younger. I think she was, when was that? Maybe 19, 20, 21 or whatever. So now she's like 24, 25. So I guess age, you know, the court says, listen, we don't want to ruin young people because uh, they've made some stupid choices. She has some degree of mental health issues. Get her some help. Get her counseling and she'll be okay. Um, John is asking, what was her demeanor like in court? Um, normal. <laughs> I mean, perfectly fine. Like I said, she dressed extremely well, had the highest six inch high heels to court, um, wore pink was her primary color, pink handbag, pink outfit, very flowerly and, and, you know, had on her makeup done. She looks like an average beauty queen just going to an event that was of no concern to anybody. Um, didn't say anything. The only thing is when she was coming out of court, we um, took a picture for the purposes. I took a picture for the purposes of her story. And she mumbled something to her lawyer like, oh, she didn't want her picture taken or something like that. And I think he kind of said to her, well, uh, you know, it's in a public space. You don't exactly have a choice um, to just let's go to the car. So he drove her um, and her mom. So this is the photo of the two of them and the attorney leaving the courthouse um, late yesterday. So she had, she had one minute pause and wanted to go back in the courtroom. He was like, no, let's just go. Um, the mother has a little bit of a smile in her face. Poor her. What a mess. But yeah, there she is. There she is. She had on multicolored sho shoes. She had her little pink handbag. Um, you know, dress, dress to kill. That's all I can tell you. Uh, the devil goes to church too, says Marshall. Vicky says, take the money that she was given for Miss Cayman and give it to the people for the damages and hurt. It's all about, it is all about her, as the old people used to say, me, myself, and I. Hmm. Uh, Karen shares a sentiment, says take the money she got from the pageant to pay um, for her help with the issues. Uh, Robert, good morning, says, hi, Sandra, hope that all is well. I feel the same thing, for, I feel the right thing for her to do as a representative for the Cayman Islands would be for her to make a public apology announcement, just my opinion. Well, Robert and Janet says, and step down. That would mean that she would have to be taking some accountability for her behavior. Now, I think this is interesting. I've never been guilty of something, taken to court and sat there and hold my ground and said, I'm not guilty and make it go through this trial because you victimize people over again. And it's a whole thing, right? It says a lot about someone who is not willing to even avoid this public spectacle. Because she could have done a plea deal where it's like, okay, I'll plead to these charges. And then we would never have gotten to hear, well, except that I go read the court files, <laughs> but we would have never gotten to hear all the details and the eyewitness and how he described how she broke his glasses and he's there crying on the stand. You know, sometimes you make your situation worse when you're unwilling to admit that you have done wrong. I don't know how many of y'all grew up with parents that used to tell you that. They come and they tell you straight up. Admit your wrongdoing as early as possible because we will have mercy. Th throw your foot, throw yourselves at the foot of the court and beg for mercy. Because to go through all of this, a three, four day trial, you're not innocent. You're innocent. The court is not going to, first of all, you, you would get some consideration for an early guilty plea. Now the court is not going to give you any mercy for any of that stuff because they're like, you wasted the court's time. You victimize your victims. We went through all of this because you refuse to admit that you had done anything wrong. So to Robert's point, even McKeeva Bush eventually came to his senses in his trial and admitted to the offenses. 
pled guilty, accepted the Crown's case against him. She does not seem like the kind of person who will do that. So I expect that we will be going through all of this until we get a verdict. And of course, she knows what's at stake. Because the second she pleads guilty, there goes that crown that she so desperately wanted. So she's not going to do it. Al Ray says, you're either mental, be committed, uh, not responsible, or responsible, pay for the crimes committed. Sandy says, Dean, my two cents from a distance is a girl been qualified to represent a country while being charged and the rest due to her bad behavior, I place squarely on the committees, at the committee's feet. Mm-mm-mm. Ms. Brenda says, not just the committee. In other words, she's holding the ministry responsible for this as well. Good morning, Siobhan. How are you? I think this is the first time I've seen you commenting on our show. So good to see you here. She says, so you just said what is good for one is good for the other. You also said people get disqualified for less than this girl did. So you're saying it's okay to do what she did and stay in. No, that's that's not what she's saying. Um, you're just as bad then, but he had need to step down. Every time he drinks, he's in some kind of trouble, but don't need a person like that represent his country. She needs help. Oh, um, no, I don't I don't think that that's um I don't know if you're referring to the caller, but I don't think anybody's saying that. People are saying that um, she should take accountability and she should step down. So um, Marshall says Miss Cayman was in there because they know it's true. <laughs> uh, Moya says she's poking us all in the eye. Uh, Miss Brenda says the mental health issues will prevail. Remember the government said it's a sensitive situation. Listen. If they really believe that it's a sensitive situation and she has mental health issues, as someone who is holding the crown at this particular time, have they even offered her any mental health assistance? This is not, this is not where you know when people really take a situation seriously, right? If they believe this is a sensitive situation, she has serious mental health issues, she's suicidal, blah, 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 blah. Uh, question, has anyone in the ministry demanded for her to go and get a proper psychological assessment, fitness to go overseas, fitness to, to hold that crown and to force her to get help. Anybody doing that? No, because they all want to sit back and use the mental health card as an excuse for their inability to act. It's a sensitive issue. That's an excuse why they will do nothing. Meantime, the real proof in the pudding, the real action should be that they're making her get help and nobody is doing that. Marshall says she needs to be pretty in pink, pretty in pink at Fairbanks. Maybe a new pink lady says Karen. Oh, Miss Sue says most of the Miss Cayman girls in the past years never been like that. Maybe when the Miss Universe contest finds out about this mess, they will stop her entering the contest. Well, according to the local pageant here, they've gotten the okay. Although I note with interest, the last time that I checked, they still had not updated her on the Miss Universe International pageant. They still have the old pageant queen listed on there. So that's a little bit weird. It's almost as though Miss Universe International is not willing to accept Tiffany. What else would explain why they've not updated the website? Let me double check. Let me make sure that what I tell you um, is correct in real time. So it's missuniverse.com. Let me check and see who they have up for the Cayman Islands. Let me see pageant girls. Where's the whole list of girls now? Um, they have a whole area where you can see who the title holder is for each country. Last time I checked, it wasn't Miss Cayman for the Cayman Islands. And I think that that says a lot because normally they update this stuff pretty quickly. So why have they not yet updated her? Hmm. It's a million dollar question. Um, trying to see where on the website it is now. So yes. Really, really bizarre competition. Let me see the competition. 
So they have competition details. Um, the New Orleans, da 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 da. Where is the list? They move things around on the website a little bit. Director portal. Uh, can somebody else maybe help me find it while I'm select committee performers? I think this is. Um, Anyway, I'm going to keep looking to see if I can find it. Um, it was on here. Now it looks like they've kind of changed the website around a little bit. But anyway, she couldn't be found. Um, and this was just a couple of weeks ago. They had um, the other young lady listed um, who won it last time. <clears throat> mm -hmm. uh, I'll see if I can find it again. It'll take me a little bit of time. But anyway. Um, she wasn't there. So why why haven't they updated it? Um, Miss Brenda says, go to Burger King, get her a crown. <laughs> Sue says, in the past, there was um, competent members of the committee. Standards and principles existed. Anthony says, the fact that she's not stepped down alone demonstrates her unfitness for the role. Yeah, I mean, she would rather, I mean, this is just, you know, uh, my position on this, my opinion, but it seems to me that she would rather bring complete disgrace to the Crown, the committee, the ministry, the Cayman Islands government, everybody, right, in light of these allegations, and just will not step down. So... Um, yeah, I don't know where they moved, who's representing who, um, what countries and stuff like that. But let me, let me see if I can find it. So Palmer says she needs help badly. I think we can all agree to that. Vicky says the mother's worse than her. The mother came out of the courtroom with a smile like a clown. Um, so it was no big deal. I think people smile for different reasons. So, um, maybe nervousness, you know? Um, yeah. Oh, they have a, they have a phone number for Miss Universe. Let me see if I can call them and ask them where, where is the list if they moved it off the website? Um, I'm curious to know where it is. 905-9305. Let's see if anybody actually answers the phone. 9305. Yes. Um, yeah, I think she's probably just nervous. So let's let's give the mother a bit of a break. That was probably just a nervous smile. Okay, that phone that phone doesn't even ring. <laughs> okay, that's a New York number. Uh, Jonathan says, I know one thing. If I was in that situation and all that damage was done to my property, the people would have seen someone having a mental breakdown going in full. What is that? Cobra Kai mode? <laughs> okay. Uh, franchise holders to publish acceptance letter from Ms. Brenda says, ask the franchise holders, which is government, to publish acceptance letter from Universe International. Uh, the people have a right to know. Mm -mm -mm. All right. Let me wrap up a few um, other things here as it relates to... Um, as it relates to other court matters. So police officer Courtney Levy is in court um, for intimidating a witness and basically threatening her in the murder case where now Mr. Roger D. Ward Bush has been found guilty of killing his own son. The allegation was that um, she, this young lady who testified who was dating D. Ward at some point uh, was threatened by this police officer shortly after the murder um, to say that the boss man said, must keep your mouth shut. And she'd seen them talking to each other. So she knew that two of them were friends. His phone, um, Roger Deward Bush, his phone number was found in the phone in the mother. Uh, hold on now. Courtney Levy, the police officer's mother's phone. So he wasn't using his own phone to call him. He took his mother's phone to call someone who was arrested for murdering his own son. And so there was a link that the two of them had a connection. So he will now, he's been charged. 
And that trial, I don't know what the trial date will be, but we'll keep you guys updated. Um, yes, he will. Um, he will now uh, face some, uh, at least a trial at the very minimum for what he is alleged to have done. It's, it is unbelievable. Um, so we'll see. I will certainly keep you guys updated on that one. And then, like I said, the man here, um, uh, Mr. What's his name? Um, Rupert has been Mr. Rupert has been um, Ingram has been sentenced to 25 months. The only thing I can say about that situation is although everyone believes that he was trying to sexually assault this woman, that is not what he was charged with. He was charged with assault ABH. He choked her for over a minute. The judge made comments in court yesterday that he could have killed this woman, right? He was choking her for over a minute. He could have easily killed her if she was not a fighter. She's going to come on the show and she's going to stay, share her very, very inspirational stories with you guys. What an amazing, you know, at some point in life, we may all become victims of different things, but your resilience and your ability to stand up for yourself and stand in the face of these things can then be an inspiration to other people because she fought that woman is alive today to tell the story. And so he only got 25 months in jail, time served and all this other stuff. And then he will be deported. I think that unfortunately, that's probably the best that we could have um, hoped for. Um, get him out of here, send him back to Nicaragua, make him go try it there so somebody can probably deal with him with some street justice. Oh, yeah. Somebody is asking about the FIFA court. Thank you. Good question. Uh, the, the judge is now wrapping up. I think they had some legal arguments and stuff yesterday. So the judge will soon give it to the jury. Um, and then we will have the verdict for you as soon as possible. So we've got Renee. She is listening to the, um, the trial and monitoring it. And as soon as we have a verdict, we will know. So I'm hearing something about some operation down in East End this morning behind the Eastern Star Bar and gas station, confiscated some drugs and a boat, but the three guys got away to room the Cayman Islands. That's just our community sources telling me this. I'll see if I can reach out to the RCIPS, but... It's probably not far off. <laughs> People in the community know what's going on. Okay. Um, so we are waiting the verdict in the FIFA case. I'll let you guys know as soon as that is available. So somebody has an interesting question. This person says, um, why aren't the former Miss Caymans speaking out, especially the recent ones, Mariah, Georgina, et cetera? She's disgraced all of them. I, I don't know. It's a, it's a question. <laughs> I think Mariah even interviewed her and went as far as um, defending her at some level, which a lot of people were, were disappointed in because we'd always held Mariah in extremely high esteem. Georgina, I don't think, has said anything publicly about this at all. Um, I know some of the other contestants have reached out to me and have shared their thoughts privately by way of email and instant messaging and something, you know, other things like that. Anthony says, Mariah defended her on the radio. I do recall that. I think a lot of people were very disappointed in Mariah because, you know, Mariah's reign was um, wonderful, spectacular, really admirable young lady. And for her to go out on a limb for Tiffany now has people questioning Mariah's character. Anyway, what can you do, beautiful folks? Uh, it's another day here in the Cayman Islands. So tomorrow is Wednesday. Um, I'm not sure if we'll have anyone on for a Caribbean connection. 
<laughs> Wednesday. But um, I do want to talk about the, the CMR community page, which is really, really important. Some notices have been going up on there about missing money and all sorts of stuff. And then I also will be sharing our Cayman Connections interview. So if you love Cayman history and so on, Mr. Wendell's interview will be um, Wendell Burlington. His interview will be airing tomorrow morning. So please, please, please tune in for that as well. And that's all I got for you. You guys have a fantastic day. Please um, be safe out there on the roadways. We'll continue to monitor everything that's happening in the Cayman Islands from the drug boat in East End to the rest of it. Um, and, um, you know, I want to talk a little bit about the BRAC situation with drugs as well. Some interesting posts went up yesterday in relation to that, which I think we need to discuss. All right, my good people, until tomorrow, please be safe. Uh, safe on the roadways. Take your time driving. And we will see you tomorrow morning at 7.30 a.m. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of The Cold Hard Truth on Bobo 89.1 FM. Cayman's number one talk show is live weekdays from 7.30 a.m. Never miss an episode again. Watch anytime on CMR's Facebook and YouTube channels for the latest show episodes. Don't forget to follow us online on our social media channels and visit CaymanMarlRoad.com for all the latest news and community happenings. 